everybody? How's it hanging? How's it happening? You guys know who it is. This is Kevin from the Code Progression Podcast, brought to you by My Song of the Day, Rock 2008, where we are unearthing the underground and rock and metal music to bring you the bands. They're going to be the biggest bands by the end of the decade so that you can break to all your friends like, hee hee, I knew about them before you did, with an in-depth interview. And my God, this one, we went super in-depth, and this one is funny as hell. So we had them on the podcast back before COVID-19 hit, and about five and a half months later, boom, they asked to be on again. And they were so much fun the first time, I couldn't say no this time. And this time was even better than the first. So please welcome back the guys from the band Generation Underground. You're going to want to listen to this one because it has a lot in it about what they've been up to, the crazy ride they've been on the past five months, and, well, how great things are going to be in the future. Are you ready? Let's go! Yeah! Well, 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 ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this is the Core Progression Podcast. You go all the way back to the beginning of March before the world went to shit. We interviewed these guys, and just recently, they messaged me back and said, hey, can we do another one? My response was, yeah. So yeah. here they are, once again, the guys from the band Generation Underground. So guys, welcome back. It's great Thanks to be back, Kevin. And, and, and also to the other guy that wasn't here that's not Mike or Josh. Yeah. How's it going, man? Hello. Matt. Yes. Alrighty. So, sh- should I make because we all know Mike, we all know Josh. Should I make Matt do the uh, the introduction that I've having? I'm having everyone do on these yeah, podcasts. Yeah, should. All mm-hmm. right, Matt. Well, so you're gonna have to introduce yourself by saying what your name is, what you do in the band, and then also we're going all middle school on your ass and doing a little fun fact about yourself. And it can be anything. And I still think my top one is there was a band called Broken Youth. They all gave me their Tinder bios. It was incredible. Nice. That's nice. great. All right. Well, I'm Matt. I'm the drummer. And uh, fun fact about myself, I've been drumming. Oh, I'm 16 years old. I just turned 16. I've been drumming for about 12 years. And yeah. So I've been drumming for three quarters of my life, basically. <laughs> I know. He joined the band when he was 12. Yeah. So so you've been with the band for a quarter of your life. Yeah. He, yeah. he was in the band from November 2016 to May 2019. was gone for about eight or nine months. And then he's been back since about since quarantine. Basically. Yeah, since about March. <laughs> So he literally came back right after the first one we shot. Uh, maybe two weeks later. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, oh, man, you missed out on that one, Matt. Well, but at least well, you're not missing out on this one. So, yeah. Woo! Yeah. All righty. So talk to you guys. So the last time we met with you guys, this was before the world completely went to crap and everything got shut down. And we were forced to stay inside and the gym closed and concerts got canceled. And, ah! Yeah, I know. It sucks. Yeah. It really does suck. It really does. So what's what's been up with you guys so far? All right, so um, take a drink of water first. Um, Got to stay hydrated. So since we uh, last talked to you guys, we uh, finally released our uh, long-awaited second record, uh, Cold Blooded Volume 1, available on all streaming platforms and in our merch store for physicals. Um, yeah, that came out on 4-2020, surprise release. We kept it pretty quiet and surprised that no one leaked it, which was great. And uh, that came out. It uh, charted on the Amazon charts. We went number seven on the rock charts and number 19 on the overall charts. So rock chart-wise, we lost to like Trivium and Five Finger Death Punch in this moment and Bob Dylan. So really not bad company. And I think Taylor Swift had us be in the overall charts. Oh, yeah. I'll say it's never a bad thing when it's like you're on those charts and the peop- and the band some of the bands that beat you out like especially one being Trivium where I think as of right now that is my pick for album of the year because that was absolutely that incredible. So it was yeah. it was insane. But I mean, if you're in that same company with Trivium, Five Finger Death Punch, uh, in this moment, and then putting Bob Dylan in that conversation as well, I mean, know. come on, you you, you got you got to look at that and be like, hey, we're a part of that. Oh yeah, yeah right, yeah. So, yeah, so that happened. Um, Shit kind of got very weird. The band ended up breaking up for about a month or so. And then kind of really sat there. I was like, you know, um, I don't really know what else to do other than music. So we kind of sat there. We're like, we need to fix this shit. So we um, 
Were we ever telling you about our former manager that we had at the time, like the manager we were working with and shit or no? Um, I'm trying to think because I've heard of, I'm trying to think of what's because I think you guys did on the last podcast. I'm trying to think of what story it was just because my uh, <laughs> my I've heard so many crappy manager <laughs> stories, so I don't know which one is which anymore. <laughs> Um, yeah, pretty much. They told us in March, right after our interview that our, I was like, look, I'm like, guys can help us get a booking and you're like, no, your music sucks. I'm like, wow. I thought you were our manager. Like, no, you guys suck as a band. You guys need to redo everything. You guys need to start over. We're like, okay, it, it, we're done. We're done trying with this shit. Yeah. And then, uh, <clears throat> nothing happened for a few months and then when we decided to reform the band we're like well number one most aggravating thing is our fucking manager so let's get rid of him so i gave him a call and we kicked his ass to the curb and ev- everyone that works then i was like they're like well you go, do you guys want to come do this album in houston nope why not we're not interested anymore you had your fucking chance so they pretty much hated everything we ever did up to the point they met us. They want us to completely abandon all of our material. Don't ever play it again. Don't ever even touch it or promote it again and completely just do things their way. And then their way was emo rap. Oh God. Exactly. Like Juice World, like XXS Tentacion style, like emo rap, like little peep. <laughs> and their I'll- big thing was they're like, don't you guys want to be rock stars? I'm like, yeah, but I don't want to make an emo rap though. Yeah, and it's and with your style of music as well, it's I mean not only that, but just I gotta start with this where if they're gonna tell you, okay, we like they try and get you in by saying, Oh yeah, we want you as a part of this label, we want you to be we want to manage you, we want to, you know, work with you, we we love what you got, and all of a sudden you come in and they're like, Okay, what we told you was a fucking lie, and we want to just do everything much. our way, so don't even go near what you guys have done. I mean, pretty much at that point it's they're trying to formulate the sound for you. And by the time it would get down to it, if you guys took it down that route, you'd be writing music, you'd be writing these emo raps, and all of a sudden you wouldn't have any like heart in it. There'd be no passion, nothing. And it just wouldn't like none of that would resonate. Could it like would it be maybe successful right off the bat, especially with a lot of promotion? It very well could. However, the problem is, is you guys would probably be like, What what the fuck are we doing here? This just is, this is not good. That was we, I was going through a lot of personal things in between like September and um, January and like it got very, very dark at one point and they kind of were the only thing to keep me going for a while, like keeping me alive, just away from doing fucking bad things to myself. And, you know, then on my 21st birthday, they decided to tell us, you know what, guys, the record you guys spent 10 months on? Nah, we don't fucking like it. We don't like it at all. And... You guys are going to do emo rap. I was like, what does this mean? They're like, no drums, no bass, no distorted guitars. And then this motherfucker tries to play a distortion riff. They're like, no, 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 no distortion. I'm like, this is awful. This is so bad. So the next day we decided, fuck them. We're putting the record out on 420. like we were supposed to put it out. So we put the record out. And of course, did they ever say anything about it? No, they didn't even know it came out. That's how much of a great magic team we had. They didn't even know we put a record out. They had no idea. How the hell do you not know if they put a record out, especially if you're the one managing them? I mean, that's your fucking job right there. And then they tried turning and says, like, oh, well, we can go like down like that metalcore beatdown, you know, state sick recording label. I'm like, yeah, it's too late for that. I'm like, you guys are just now going to tell us exactly what we want to hear so you don't lose us. And you guys already lost us. And I was going to willing to like hear that out. But when they had the nerve to tell us, you know what, like, we don't like your music and your music's not good enough to get a booking agent. I'm like, okay, fuck you then. Enough. So, and the record, this record right here, the one that said it was garbage and will never sell, moved 46,000 streams on Spotify in six weeks. In six weeks? In Damn. Six weeks. That passed this one in a year and a half in six weeks. Obviously, <clears throat> The record's good. People really like the songs. And we made the right choice. So, yeah, I mean, that's our manager much, was dead wrong about that. Completely dead wrong about it. I mean, that's pretty much validation right there for what you guys were doing. It's, or, it was the greatest validation of all time to have it to where not only did we put out on our own terms, but we dropped it and it moved 46,000 streams in six weeks. Yeah, because even taking a look at the Spotify stats right now, it's... Um, just taking a look at it, it looks like there might be 
only one song off of your other record that t- has a chance to there's that even one of them yeah there's w- no actually all five of the songs that were off of cold-blooded are above your initial release in terms of overall plays uh, every single one of them that so, goes to show you we made, we made the right call <laughs> we doubled down on ours my, like my whole point was they sucked the fun out of doing music. It wasn't fun anymore. We, 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 literally, we were at, we wanted to kill each other. We were so miserable. Like it wasn't fun anymore. And then like, it came to points like, wh- why are we doing this? If it's not fun. The record currently sits at the same number of streams. They stopped promoting it after that. But besides that, like you get the idea. So, you know, it, it, it really sucks. Number one of how long they let us on for, but number two, the fact that they didn't even know we put the record out just go to show me how much they did not care at all. But moving past that chapter, so everybody from that whole team was just kicked out right out the fucking door. I was like, goodbye, get out. They're like, well, I'm like, get out, get the fuck out now. <laughs> Enough. I'm like I'm taking back my career with this band. So, so what we did was after we broke the band up, we were like, all right, if we're going to fix this, we need to figure out where the problems lie. So we, we had a meeting, the three of us. We went over all the issues we've ever had in the past. We just talked everything. It wasn't even necessarily anything that, anything that crazy. And before us, we had fired the manager. And I was like, okay, you know what? Now we got something to prove. Now we got something to prove. We got to go prove them wrong and we can do this. And we just been spending every drop since the middle of June just organizing things and planning things out and just hiring new people and getting rid of everybody that just sucks and just getting rid of all of it and our new publicist i i couldn't say enough fucking positive things but that guy is fucking amazing his name's adam ramey sings for this band called dropout kings from arizona that guy within two weeks within four days of a 30 dollar facebook ad got us four thousand facebook likes damn yeah so we are very happy to have him. We've got 300 Instagram followers in two weeks. It was more than we had in like the last year we had gained. So we are so happy to have a great team between him and his guitar player does our work for us now. And just overall people making risers and t-shirts and CDs and just, it's amazing. That's such a great team behind us. Finally, we finally get our, fair share and the scary thing is my publicist would say and he'd be very stone saying he'd be like dog this is only the beginning they have <laughs> no idea what's coming they have no idea he's so funny on the phone he is so funny on the phone so but his enthusiasm is through the roof he's like bro he's like dog i got a great he's like let's take all of your music he's like and let's recycle he's like all the shit on this record that no one has heard of yet he's like we're gonna fucking recycle it in front of new people he was like just because it came out almost two years ago doesn't mean it's fucking old. It's new to someone new because it is. I've never heard it before. It's new to them. Yeah, so. there's, gonna, there's gonna be plenty of people that you're gonna, especially if you're able to recycle it. All of a sudden, boom, you're gonna get in front of many different listeners. You get in front of many different people, and by the time you do that, it's especially with the promotion that you have behind you right now with this publicist. Holy crap! Especially with four thousand likes on your Facebook page after a couple of days. I mean, on a thirty dollar ad. Come on, that gets hey. killer. Obviously, like what we're starting to understand, the three of us is the music was always there. It was always good. I mean, look, this record, I wouldn't change a single thing about it. I would change maybe like a measure or two of how long certain parts go on certain songs, but nothing crazy. We poured, they always say you have the, the your whole life to write your first record, which we did, which came out great. I still wouldn't change really a thing. There's nothing more really to prove on. And then this, we spent 10 months on. I mean, this whole thing right here was recorded in six weeks, was recorded the whole thing. It was written over, I mean, we had the, re, the remat, probably like, it was written over like a year and a half yeah. between like from the, the time we wrote the first song or about two years from the time we wrote the first note of the first song to the time it came out, about two years and some change. So, and this was 10 months. This was also 10 months. This is not available yet. It will be sometime so, soon though. We'll get to that later. <laughs> yeah, we will get to that later. So yeah, no, we're... um. <laughs> We're very happy to have an unbelievable team of people behind us that believe in us 100%. And now that our music is getting in front of more people, really is going to show that the music is really that good. Like we just, I mean, we always thought it was good, but it's nice to hear from other people like, yo, come to the Philippines. I'm like, hmm. I don't know how we're going to get to the Philippines, but okay. Yo, come to Hawaii and Russia and fucking 
Salt Lake City in Edmonton, Alberta. I'm like, all right, you, you just keep giving the list. Keep keep it coming. Keep it coming. We'd be surprised, too, because I did an interview with a band from Singapore. They were called Igneous Sons. And what happened was I put out a, like an Instagram ad just like in, of course, the United States. But I also put it out in all those Southeastern Asian countries. So I wanted to see what happened. Holy shit. I think I got like four or five thousand likes off of a twenty dollar ad just basically because, OK, they, they they all love the music over there. They love it in the Philippines. They love it in Malaysia. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, I'm getting like my phone just blowing up. I'm like, what the hell? All of a sudden I look at it. I'm like, oh, I've, this ad's been out for like two hours. And I've already got a thousand likes on it. Holy shit. And then all of a sudden, like and like the next day when I woke up, it was at twenty five hundred. I'm thinking, God damn. I got to market there more. I know. Right. There, look, there's a the way I, I tell people to try to get in the music industry is there's a lot of good people in this industry. You have to find them because there's a lot of shitty people too. There's just as many good people as many shitty people. You just got to find, you got to number one, believe in your own music. That's been our big thing. We've always believed in our music, whether it was, whether what stage it was at at the development, we've always believed in what we were doing and we never followed any trends or anything. And, you know, then you got to find some people to help you promote it. Cause like promoting like my, um, I forget who told me this, but pretty much I was told like the amount of money you put into recording this or this or this, you know, you have to put a decent amount of money, if not the same or more in marketing it because just because you put the record out doesn't mean people are going to hear it. Like you need to market it, you know, and that's how, that's how all the algorithms work with Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. Like, you know, you want your shit more in front of more people? Sure. Hey, yeah. Exactly. And I'm kind of having a little bit of an issue with that right now as well here because um, I've been trying to get like a lot more guests on the podcast. Well, so I could do Tuesday and Thursday episodes and also try to cut, fry some bigger fish at the same time as well. And that started working out pretty well when I started making a couple of posts on like some serious XM Octane fan groups. And someone gave me the idea to interview this one man. I'm not going to say their name because... They kind of, it's kind of like a challenge, kind of like that chip on the show that you were talking about because the band said they wanted to do the podcast. And then I was talking with their management team and they asked me like, how many streams are you getting per episode right now? I'm like, eh, between like YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Google Play, like overall, it's around two to 300 per. And the email I got back just said, come back when you have a few thousand per. And that was all it said. And I was just, and I was just like, <laughs> um, wow. And after that, I saw that I'm like, I, I I printed out the email. I printed it out. I put it on the wall above my computer, just as like that uh, bulletin board material. I even, I even emailed them back. I'm like, thanks for the bulletin board material. And then I posted a picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger in the email and said, I'll be back. And now I'm talking with a bunch of other people as well to try and help promote the podcast. So I get to that point and then I can send them the metrics and just say, and I'm hoping I can do this like in the next like month or two and just say, told you. And if they're like, well, do you want to schedule the band to be on? Yeah, because the band wanted to do it from the first from the first place. I'm not going to hold them against it. Like they wanted to no. do it. So I'm good with it. But kind of where I was going to go with that story was what you're talking about with your old management team and the old uh, people you had working on it where that they didn't believe in you and you kicked them to the curb. It kind of puts that chip on your shoulder, too. And it kind of gives you that added motivation, that added fuel to the fire just to keep going and just to. Now, it, 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 just to show it really up anyway. does between how we had a tour lined up that fell through the guy ran with our money. We had to assume to get our money back. Bass oh. player quit. Then we had another bass player who joined and left us hung and dry in the middle of the tour, which was fucking wonderful to just leave. When he knew we were in such a bad position to just do it again to us, a really shitty drummer at the time, not you. Um, <laughs> and, you know, a manager that was leading us on and on and on and on. And then two of the three producers, the one guy was trying to go behind the manager's back and try to cut deals on the side. And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? And then they did this shit. And then the manager had no idea what they were doing behind each other's back. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And then they brought in another producer and he didn't help either. We're like, uh, I'm like, this is just fucking great. And then it just drags on and on and on. And me and him are like, can anything go right for the love of God? Could something go right? And then like, and then things started getting better. We, we landed a show in Hollywood, which uh, we'll see if Hollywood happens in December. We'll say, you know, I would like it to happen. It was supposed to happen in June, the show with Jack Russell from Great White, but we'll see. And, you know, after a while, it's like, it became, it wasn't fun anymore. It's like, this sucks. So they're just, they're sucking the life out of us. And never thought in a million years, just firing them 
would like ignite this fire under me. I'm like, you know what? Fuck you. You know what? If you don't like their music, I'm going to prove to you what you missed out. I'm going to prove to you what you did, what you fucked up with. And we were on a mission to prove them wrong. And you know what? Now that we understand how the industry works, we know exactly what to look out for. And we pretty much our whole mentality is if you work for the band, either do your job or you're getting fired. It's one or the other. You can pick. I don't care. Don't give me the middle bullshit. You either you're in or you're out. It's that simple. And we couldn't be happy with team people that work with us. We really do. If you're watching this interview, we need a big, we do need a bass player. So I don't care where you live. It doesn't matter what your background is. As long as you're willing to show up and play some shows, uh, shoot us an email at generation underground band at gmail.com. All ages, all everything. There's no specifics. Just show up and have a good attitude. That's all we ask. So I'm pretty sure the specifics is show up, have a good attitude and be able to play bass. That, that's that's pretty much like three. And if you can't play bass, we'll teach you how to play bass. Oh, there you go. They're, they're yeah. offering you lessons here, people. We <laughs> even have we even have a bass you could use and a wireless pack and a head and cab. Like you just gotta show up. That's it. But if anyone has ever wanted to join a band and has no idea how to do it, I mean, they're just giving you the in right now. Like this is an opportunity for you guys to take. What are you guys waiting for? I know we've got three people here to teach you how to play bass and all the songs. Yeah, yeah. literally. Not that hard. Yeah. What What more do you need? You can live out. You can you can finally live out your dreams of well, either being a rock star of, or maybe if you feel like you need to do something with your life, Bing Bang Boom. There you go. Yeah. But you gotta well, love music though. Yeah. You got you gotta love music. Gotta have the good attitude. And you gotta get along with the guys too because band chemistry is always a key. Yeah, it did something we've known over the years. Like I mean, they've been in the in and out of this band for relatively about two years not like necessarily steady two years but like at least somewhat in the picture for two years at different times and you know i've agreed it's the same thing with everyone else i've said is there's a reason why they're still here with me is because they get it he may be 16 he may be 18 almost 19 but they get it and for the people that are older than us that are like 23 or 25 who still can't get it it's like maybe you should fucking look in the mirror and figure out why you don't get it maybe just a thought you know yeah one other thing too is there definitely is just hearing you guys talk over the past like 20 minutes especially you mike there's you're talking about like you have it like after you fired that management team like it just ignited a fire up and you was like you got to a low point and i mean i did that personally too with my, my life in general where i got to like the rock bottom point where i'm like what the fuck am i doing and all of a sudden from that boom I'm, I'm here doing this stuff now and i'm absolutely loving it but then from you it's just not only hearing that that story but also just how much different your tone of voice, how much different your attitude is from the last time we talked versus this time. It's completely different. Like there is so, so much more vigor behind your voice when you're talking about this stuff. It is, you, you can tell that there is definitely that chip on your shoulder. There's definitely that fire in your belly. And there's also just a bunch of other things going on right there that have you motivated to just go forward and kick some motherfucking ass. I have to agree with, with you and our publicist, our publicist. I mean, we were ready. We were, we were like, you know, we were doing things on our own, kind of getting prepared. We knew, we knew the record was probably going to come out in November anyway. Like we weren't quite sure, but we were pretty, pretty sure. And, you know, once he hired our publicist, he was like, bro, he's like, let's plan this whole thing out. I was like, you know, we've never planned anything out in our entire career. This is going to be different. And he's like, bro, he's like, Interview here, interview there, podcast, this, that, play through, this, vlog, this, music video, music video, single, single, single. We're like, okay, you know what? This is, this is easy. This is the busiest this band's ever been. And we're not even playing shows. We're this busy. We got a new music video for Shook of the Core coming out next month on the 18th, brand new music video. And then the, the grand announcement got confirmed last night and we'll say it on the air coming on October 16th. The first single of Cold Blooded Volume 2 featuring Pablo, drummer and backing vocalist of Chelsea Grin. How the hell do you say Pablo's last name? I have no, literally no idea. I don't know. We're going to look this up. It starts with a V, like Pablo Verdi, maybe? Let's get this right. Let's get this right. I'm looking it up right now, too, to see if I can pull it up. Is it Pablo Viveros? Yeah, Viveros. Viveros. Woo! I beat you guys to it. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, I got like three different screens going at the same time too, with a bunch of other shit alongside. So, 
I mean, yeah, like, no, I mean, it's, I'll, um, and the craziest thing is also we can announce that he's going to be in the music video with us too, which is going to be really sick. We just yeah. locked that in. So we got it. We're going to get at least one more guest on volume two. It's not that I can't announce it. It's more of, it's not confirmed yet. So I don't want to say it until it's confirmed, but when it's confirmed, trust me, you will hear about it. You will definitely hear about it. Fair enough on that. Now I got to ask when it comes to this, uh, first single off of Cold Blooded Volume Two. How did you guys get Pablo on this one? Even though it was just confirmed yesterday, what was the process for getting him on this? Was it from that uh, your publicist and from the new management team that helped you set this up, or um, what's the not story? Really, they they, they kind of they were pushing for it hard, but um, this is website called FeatureX.com where you can message artists and you can and they could do guest features. So you have people like Spencer from Ice Nine Kills, and they had. Levi and Ryan from Miss May I, two guys from Fifth from King. They had uh, Wit from Kane Hill. They had Ricky from Ice Nine Kills. They had um, Pablo and Tom from Chelsea Grin, Ryu from Crystal Lake, and someone else from Crystal Lake. Oh, so they God. gave you this whole list of people you could work with. The, yeah. the bass player in Bear Tooth was on the list too. Uh, Tyler Carter from Issues was on there too. <laughs> so they gave you a lot of options. So, and we kind of were just trying to figure out like, who would fit the best in the song and Pablo reached back after he reached back first after we had a few people and he was the most in, excited and enthusiastic about it. And it does happen to know that our publicist is good friends with Pablo too. Yes. So it's like a win-win. So it's like, he's like, dude, Pablo's my dog. <laughs> <laughs> so now you have to maximize that too. Cause when you start just running down the list of all those people that were on there, not going to lie. I think you guys may have figured it out and maybe marketed that to me perfectly. Cause when you're talking about that feature X, the first person you, you uh, mentioned on that to be on there, I'm just like, my God, I love that guy's music. Holy shit. Yeah. Well, because I got a, that Ice Nine Kills poster up there. Someone made me this little like custom Funko Pop of Spencer. Oh, wow. Nice. That's cool. They that also is- made me one of him as a clown. Mm. It's back nice. there somewhere. I'm just, I just want to go up and grab it. <laughs> mm. But I'm just like, if I'm an artist, like, holy shit, I'd be running through that as much as I could because of how many artists are on there that I, for me personally, that I would want to work with. I'm just like, I'd probably be messing with every one of them. And all of a sudden, it's like, well, one's bound to hit. I mean... That's how the crowd is that we're like, someone's going to say yes. There's too much money to be made here from them. And our whole thing was like, we're down to work with anybody, but they got to be in the music video. Like, like we did a guest feature with Franz from Attila on this record. And it was great, but we couldn't get him in the video. So it, like, it was like, he got like one third of the process. Like, it's like if we could have got him in the video, then he could have promoted the song and then it could have been in front of more people. So we made sure of this time to make sure that we got somebody and I wish Franz was an option. We'd fucking do Franz again. If it was available, we really would. The great person to work with. He really was. So, you know, yeah, and I totally understand what you're talking about. You want to make sure they're in the music video as well, because another band that I talked to was right after the one that we did. It was a band called Eline. They're out of Italy, and one of they ended up getting a feature with Aaron Pauly from of Mice and Men on one of their songs, and wow. they wanted to make and they got him in the music video, and that ended up really getting them a lot more notoriety over here in the states as well. So usually when you get the when you're able to get them in the music video because you have the name on there. So it's like you'll have gen like if you like I go on YouTube, search it up, be like, you know, Generation Underground, name of the song, all of a sudden featuring uh featuring uh shoot, I already forgot his name off the top of my head. My Uh-oh. god. Oh Ver- 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 Yeah, Ver- I'm like I, I was I kept thinking V. I'm like, where where's a V coming from? I'm like, oh yeah, it's his last name. Yeah. So when it comes to Pablo Viveros, it's like featuring Pablo Viveros of Chelsea Grin. So then when people are searching up Chelsea Grin, like come, that up. video is gonna end up popping up somewhere. And we played with Chelsea Green last year. So we had like the, you know, and I think Josh can agree with me on this. I one of our most intimidating moments of our whole career was we met Steven from Chelsea Green. He's like, he's like, oh, he's like, you guys fans were like, well, we're playing the show too. I mean, we're big fans. We're playing the show. He's like, oh, what time are you guys on? We're like, uh, like 2.10. He's like, all right, cool. I'll see you guys out there. We're like, oh, oh God. I'm like, the dude from <laughs> Chelsea Green's going to watch our show. And by the grace of God, we looked at her in the soundtrack and I was like, son of a bitch, he's at the bar. He's actually watching it. 
And it's not about a big song to open up. Like we open up with the You Only Live Once from Suicide Silence. We're like, this is the death core anthem. You cannot butcher this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we did a pretty good job. Our shout out to our drummer James. We had to film that day. James had to learn our entire set us in 48 hours. Jeez. Because our drummer we had at the time decided that going to Maine to buy pot was more interesting than playing the show. Oh my God! Oh, you got to be kidding me! Welcome, welcome to Generation Underground. We're like Generation Under Clowns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to start playing like some of that like clown car music, and you go like, especially for something like that. But then again, I mean, look at what happened out of it. Now you don't have to deal with somebody bailing on a show because they'd rather go to Maine to buy pot or or drop on a. We had a battle of the band show in Brooklyn to get on. Summer Slaughter, which we ended up getting on anyway. And the, the same drummer decided to call out the morning of it like 6 a.m. because he had a pinch nerve in his neck and couldn't play. So we taught the bass player, shout out to Justin Daniel for filling in that day. It really helped us out. Yeah. We taught the bass player how to play all the songs on drums. And then the bass player, who nobody liked, we had to bring back for one more show. And I almost strangled him and dragged him out of the car before we even got there. I think and you then, may have told me that story in the last podcast. Yes. And then that's the day we met our shitty manager. So it, it was a very, very weird time in our career. Very weird. It, it was it, it was like a weird like it was like a weird Twilight Zone time, even though we're kind of in that Twilight Zone time right now. Damn you, COVID. I'm still going to keep yeah. saying that because I'm, I'm cursing it. I'm cursing its name <laughs> just for well, <laughs> not for I was going to say for funsies. But no, I'm, I'm very serious about that. But holy yeah. shit. I mean. But I, what I still want to understand is just, again, why the hell do you want to go by pot when all of a sudden you have a chance to play in front of someone from Chelsea Grin who, you know, you, you all these guys that are in the industry right now, they're going to be listening to these bands, especially these more up and coming bands, because there's going to be at some point these guys are going to go on tour. They're going to be looking for supporting acts for them, and they're going to want to find a, a, a band that not only is going to work well with their crowd, but is also going to work well with them on the road because you're on the road for a month and a half to two months, maybe even three months at a time. So you got to make sure that camaraderie is there and you're going to just take that opportunity to go buy weed. Come on, yeah. man. Uh, it's, it's really amazing. And, you know, we learned a lot last year. I mean, things went very well for us and then they hit rock bottom. We, and we really learned what to look out for. We really learned like, okay, like this is how it should be done. This is not how it's going to be done. And like, this is how things need to be this way and that way. And, you know, I do have to thank, um, we did have a fourth member for about a month and then he, he decided to drop out the day of our music video. He decided to, to drop with the face of the fucking earth, but yeah. without him actually convincing me to do music again, we wouldn't be here doing this interview. So we can thank Brandon Ryan for that one, not for leaving us out the drive for the goddamn music video, yeah. but Clown. for giving us this idea to do the band again. So we have to give credit to where credit's due, but you know. It's been a it's been a wild fucking year between like August of last year to August this year. It's it's not even the same band. We're not the same people. And thank God we're not. I, I don't want to be that person ever again. I really don't. But, you know, um, even though we're not doing shows, we're just so busy with just planning the next single and the artwork and the video and the concept. And then. You know, um, we're doing behind the scenes for the video and how to play the songs and how we make the songs. And that's going to be the same for Our Betrayal, which comes out on October 16th. And the record comes out on November 13th with the Brandon Boulder music video as well. And then, you know, in December, we're dropping, we're probably going to drop another song, I'll probably do one more single. So now we're all like, we're full on board. We're promoting both volumes as best as we can to our ability. We really are. We cannot wait to do this. And we really can't wait to do shows, but we have a lot of work on our end to do so we can get ready to do shows so that when we do shows, it's fun again. Yeah, because I mean, I for someone like a fan like myself, I'm missing shows wholly, just like uh, not wholly well, like, you know, brutal. Brutal. they're brutal. Like completely do the fact that I I mean, for you guys, it's a completely different story because that's what you guys are doing. That's one of the biggest money makers. You guys is playing shows. Nice toss, by the way. But and like, but like for someone like me, it's just like yeah, I'm paying to go to these shows. But it's 
there's a I've always talked to bands about this. There's a certain connection that when you guys are on stage, like I know you guys are on stage and you're just feeling this full <laughs> feel of euphoria because you're up there doing what you want to do. You're expressing yourselves through your music, through your art. And it's just this whole state of euphoria when you're up there because nothing else matters except what you're doing right there. Conversely, or reversely, whatever it is for us in the crowd. I mean, when I'm in a, yeah, when I'm in a, when I'm in a mosh pit, I'm getting knocked around left and right. Or if I end up knocking down the 265 pound guy and feel like, yeah, yeah. like I'm Arnold Dubay <laughs> kind of thing. It's just, there's somewhere it's just, I get so I'm lost in the music it. where it's I'm just, oh, it's just like a whole entire, um, what's the best way to put it? It's just a whole entire state of just nothing else matters. It's just, it's, it's a happy place. That's the best way to put it. <laughs> sure, it yeah. is. It's like, um, yeah, when they say, like, Happy Gilmore, find your happy place before Shooter McGavin comes and just ruins the whole entire thing by making out with Grandma. Yeah. I mean, I mean people got to remember, like, concerts, it's a way of, like, you know, it's 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 a form of entertainment or one, but it's also a place for people to get their shit out. Like, it's not like you don't need the bra- bring your baggage. Like, you can, you know, you don't have to deal with that shit when... You know, when you're at a concert, you can let that go in a mosh pit or a circle pit or a wall of death or watch me try to stage dive and bust my ass in the fucking crowd. Like, you know, you the, 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 it all has a purpose. It really between the merch girl, the sound guy, the people in the pit, the people taking pictures, the band on stage. Like, it's all it's always like a thing. And I always suffer. I'm like, most of the bands that are not locally, it's not anything that's local Uh-oh. level. Are usually very very humble because they know how hard it is to get to that point and stay at that point too. Yeah, it's, it's definitely hard to get to that point and stay at that point. The code is striking about. Uh, yeah, right, right now, just I'm sorry, guys, like because it's kind of like lagging on your end just a little bit on that last little segment. So I'm kind of like trying to see if like the video like resets it, like resets itself. Okay. All right, it's good now. I think it's just some something was going on. I'm not okay. sure what it was, but I got what you were saying as well. It's just again everyone's missing live shows right now we we all are and but the one thing that i've seen from a number of bands that I, 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 I always end up asking this question but i think you kind of already answered it with everything that you were saying was especially in the time we're in right now you, we can't change what's going on right now we can't just all of a sudden no. like say okay we're gonna quickly rewind the clock back six months back to february get all this shit taken care of so maybe this only lasts like a month or two We can't do that. We have to deal with the situation we have at hand right now. So how can we maximize what we're doing right now so that when we are able to go back to play live shows, when things go back to that sense of normalcy, where are we going to be and are we going to be better off from where we were? And from what it seems like what you guys went through from the band splitting up, all of a sudden the band coming back together and just getting this fire reignite under you become or getting part with a different publicist, different management team at the same time as well. And then having a plan and consistently working on new things, consistently working on newer music, consistently working on music videos, um, press releases, all that kind of stuff. I mean, the, the fire is there and then you're maximizing the time at hand right now. You're making sure that what's going on right now is not going to slow you down. Yeah, no, totally. People need to understand this. And this come, this goes to any band out there. Is if you're going to do a band, you need to at least have one person a band treat it like a real, like a fucking full time job because it's a full time job. Whether you're running Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, writing the music, recording the music, releasing it, promoting it, playing shows, setting up, like it's a full time job. And I think a lot of bands locally, what they don't understand is. If you don't have one person who's willing to take charge and do all those things, you're never going to go anywhere. Like you're not like, you're going to be, Oh, I have work. Everybody has fucking work. You need to make time to make this work. And a lot of people are not cut out for this shit. They're not. Oh, you know, if you, I tell everyone, I'm like, if you can't eat fucking shake filet in a shitty van and not take a shower for a week, it's not for you. It's not, <laughs> it's tough enough for us with, uh, with, you know, with dealing with it. But a lot of people, especially people that are not like mentally stable, they can't handle it. It's a, it's a very taxing thing to be six shows a week driving around the country and you, you're not around. You, you're, you know, it's the same people in the same sweaty, shitty van and just, you know, you miss being home. You miss your, your family. You miss your friends. Like, it's just like, you know, yeah, but it's, it's the lifestyle. It's, that's how it goes. 
So yeah, and not everyone's cut out for it either. And there's a lot of bands that will start out and like they may have an incredible sound, but if they're just not accustomed to the lifestyle, or if ever remember the band, like especially when you're going through that growth period from the beginning to the point where you know everyone's doing this full time, everyone just completely quits their job and bing bang boom, this is what you have to do. It's a completely different concept. Due to the fact that you're completely changing your whole entire your whole entire idea of a lifestyle from probably what you had growing up, from what you saw from your parents, from what you saw from society. It's because especially from uh, like a fan standpoint or just like a normal person standpoint that's not in a band, what you see is is you're always seeing just what the top tier bands are doing. Like, oh, they're traveling, doing this, that, this, that, this, that. It seems cool, but no one ever really talks about that grind it takes to get to that point and how much it takes and how long it takes. So yeah, it, it, it does take, feel like, you know, you're definitely doing not only a full-time job, it's like a full-time job and a half. And then it's also yeah. got to re- remember what else you're trying to do. Same thing here. It's just like, I've got a full-time position at, so I can make money so I can support this, but this takes up more easily more time than that. And then everything else I do, it's like, well, what do you sacrifice? I don't know. Sleep. Like yeah. five hours yeah. a night. I it's it was like what Arnold Schwarzenegger said. He's like, I sleep six hours. And he's like, some people are like, but I sleep eight hours. I sleep nine hours. Well, just sleep faster. I would recommend. And I'm like, I took that to I took it to heart. Honestly, I'm like, yeah, I'm just gonna sleep faster. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, it makes sense. And like, you know, there's a lot of ways you can do. It. Like, there's a lot of jobs nowadays you can get, like with like Uber or Lyft yeah, or DoorDash. But you can get flexible hours so you can work your band schedule around the job. Like that's how I feel like too many people don't do like, oh, well, I'm going to school. You know, there's no reason why you couldn't do school and, and work a band. Like you, but you gotta, you gotta give a priority to the band because if you don't make the band a priority, you're never going to go anywhere or at least make one person make it their life. Like it's not that hard. And I, people don't ever seem to understand that shit, which is, it blows my mind because so many bands that are so talented don't ever go anywhere because they don't, they're not cut out for it. It's, it's so sad sometimes. Like it really is. No, and it's even like taking a listen, like from a business standpoint as well, taking a listen to someone like Gary V, who always puts all his shit out there all the time, no matter what, and just freely says it. And it's like, well, why won't you make people pay for it? He's like, because 99% of the people aren't just going to listen, are just not going to do anything about it. They're just going to sit on their ass and just wonder, oh, why didn't I make it? Well, you didn't actually put in any fucking work. You just listened yeah. and you thought you were putting in work, but I kept telling you, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. But nope, you just you just didn't do it. And then when it, you start to learn exactly, if you start doing it, you learn how much it actually has to take in order to make a successful business, make a successful band. And even for the, all the kids that are in school right now, it's like, say they're in college or in high school. It's like, yeah, you're trying to start a band. You're trying to do this, oh. especially for college, too, because it's I mean, I, I went through that shit and I had more free time then than I did in any other time of my life. Yeah, was yeah. was was a coursework hard? Yeah, yeah, some of it was, but was it something where I never had like an hour, like three hours each day just to just basically do whatever the fuck I wanted and just shit like basically I could I could stand on my phone and chat for three hours and I would have missed yeah. nothing. But it's like I or, or just sit down and like play Call of Duty or something. However, that's a choice you make. If that, if that's what you want to do, by all means, go do it. But then don't complain about the fact that you're not going anywhere because. You're spending all your time playing Call of Duty, and if you were like, this is if it was ten years ago, you're telling somebody online that you fucked their mom. Yeah, I, and you know, here's the thing: people <laughs> should be smart, like the Ronnie Racky. And why don't you play Call of Duty? I want to do a fucking Twitch stream. So yeah, people right. see you do you do the the best of both worlds. And I always tell everyone the best way to model yourself in the music industry is like Franz, because fucking Franz has Attila, he has Bone Crew, he had Franz Act, that side rap project he did, he's got a clothing line, he's got a record label, and he does fucking porn now. Like, the dude <laughs> has it all. Like, he really does. And the dude's got two beautiful kids at home, he drives a fucking G-Wagon, a Lambo, he lives in Florida. Like, who's gonna have it better than that guy? Yeah, or then like, yes, yeah, my fuck. <laughs> yeah, or take a look at someone like Ronnie too. With all of a sudden, it was even before COVID hit because he started doing the whole Twitch streaming after Popular Monster dropped, and he was just reacting to people's reactions about Popular Monster, and that got his that got his Twitch growing and noticed because now people are seeing that he's interacting with his fans in a completely different way that not many artists have been doing at that time. Maybe the only other one I can think of was Matt Heafy from Trivia, yeah, who was playing. He- Heapy's an animal with the fucking Twitch streaming. 
Yeah, because I, because I, 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 someone, I, someone uh, told me to go on it yesterday because I wasn't a part of any of it. So I downloaded the app just so I could see what was going on. And I was looking at like follower count. It was like Heafy had like sixty eight thousand. I'm like, holy shit! And I'm like, okay, let's see where Ronnie's at. Almost at a hundred thousand. I'm like, god damn, <laughs> these guys yeah. are doing good. But it's just, and then all of a sudden, there's so many other people that are coming on to like that streaming platform, especially after COVID hit. Because what else are you gonna do? But especially the guys that were there first and interacting with their fans before. Before this stuff hit, I mean, they're growing. They're, they're at a different. They're at a completely different level. I mean, there's guys like Craig Mabbitt from Escape the Fate and uh, Telly from The World Alive, where they're on there now and they're doing just fine. But they're not to the level that like Matt is or the level that Ronnie's. However, I don't think anyone's gonna get to the level that Ronnie is because his just it's his personality too is just taking everything just by storm. You know, I've heard a lot of mixed reviews about Ronnie Rackett. I've never met Ronnie Rackett face to face, but I've met Matt Heafy. I've hung out with Matt Heafy. Matt Heafy is one of the nicest guys I've ever met. He's so just like he cares. Like, the best way I can say it, he just cares. He cares a lot. He really does care. He wants people to, you know, to succeed and he wants other bands out there because, you know, there is a very good scene of underground music. We have a great scene of these smaller bands like, the Varials and you know Code Orange and Knock Loose and Vane yeah. and Dead Crown and Dropout Kings and you know come on give me, give me some other smaller bands that we like <laughs> Ice Line Kills and Fire uh, <laughs> Fipper King Fipper. Um, you know <laughs> you know it, there's a good scene but they need somebody to lead the goddamn fucking charge and the only band I think of in the last 15 years I can do arenas is a day to remember and bring me the horizon. That's it. In the last 15 years, come out like metal or rock wise, it's new, it can do arenas. It's probably only those two bands. And Parkway Drive's getting close. They're getting close. But like yeah, but the, for the for the next tour though, Parkway Drive is playing arenas with all those bands, including Fit for a King. Fucking Parkway Drive, Hatebreed, Knock Loose, and Fit for a King. What could possibly go wrong? A lot, but a lot it, but but things that'll go wrong. It's because it'll, if the things that are going wrong, it'll be because the thing that happens after what goes wrong goes completely right. Exactly. Like I love how Winslow is like, I need more. I need more, more crowd surfing. <laughs> just, oh my yeah. god, I fucking love Parkway Drive so much. <laughs> but you're absolutely correct. What you're talking about, especially in the last 15 years, for bands that have come out like with Primates for Metal in the past 15 years that could do arenas. Those are the only two I could think of because I did see a date. I remember back in October at the. Uh, at the Armory in Minneapolis, which what is that like the original location for where the where the Minneapolis Lakers played? Okay, and in there there was about eighty four hundred people. Like still, I mean, still that's not an arena size, but that is a lot still to pack into one place. That's I know a lot bring me the, people bring me the rise, and I've seen him do arenas. I didn't, they didn't do one around here when they were here. They played at the Rave, so it was about two three thousand people, but it was still packed. However. When I'm taking a look at all these other bands that are in the scene right now that are not on the same level as that are basically like I like I think they're huge is because compared to some of the other bands that I listen to as well it's like just taking a look at that listener count like someone like Ice Nine Kills where they're almost at like a million streams per month on us on Spotify like I think they're I think they're a big band but then all of a sudden I take a look at like where they are in connection with everything else it's like well they kind of relatively smaller but they're so damn good it's like wow. And there's I mean, so I, many others out I there as well. How small they were just a couple of years ago. Like, and now they're on tour with fucking Five Finger, Death Punch, and Papa Roach, and I Prevail. I Prevail, I forgot about too. That band is number one, phenomenal. And number two, they draw a lot of fucking people. I Prevail. They do draw a lot of people. The one bad thing I'll say about I Prevail is when they were on tour with Beartooth and a Day to Remember, just for this, just for show flow. They should have gone before Beartooth, so they should have flipped Beartooth and I Prevail just because Beartooth's energy can not, is so hard to be matched, and the data remember could do a good job at trying to match what the hell Caleb Shomo was trying to do on stage. Like it's just like with I Prevail coming second, it was or coming after that, it was like, yeah, they're still good. Don't get me wrong, but it was just the energy level from what we had. It was just like it just felt lower than it was due to the fact that we were just going crazy with Caleb Shomo for thirty minutes. I still think that tour was supposed to happen this year got posted on the next year. The Code Orange under oath, a day to remember, Slipknot tour would have been crazy because Code Orange by themselves is batshit crazy. And let alone add a day to remember and under oath and Slipknot. Oh my God, it'd be fucking insane. Remember we saw Code Orange and the bass player yeah. stage dive and almost yeah. hit me. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, and then it's and then when you take a look at some other bands that are like playing these massive or like massive arenas as well, as well, it's just like, well, Slipknot still is. I saw Disturbed do it last year twice, so it's just the bands are still doing it. But the problem is, is I'm not I'm not knocking those bands in any way. It's just the issue is, is there's no new blood that's really taking the charge and being able to create something like that. However, that also does speak to consumer uh, tastes and preferences within the music scene, within the within the realm of the population as well. Due to the fact that it seems like a lot more people are listening to stuff that has hip hop and rap oriented in it or fucking pop country. God damn it. I still hate that shit. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'll put it this way. I know a lot of people like it. I don't mind if you like it. Just my opinion. I can't stand it. That's that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and you know, I think a, a big thing, what we were told from our former manager team was this, was a lot of the radio DJs are afraid to play newer bands. They're afraid of losing that listenership of like, oh, well, if I play, you know, if I play Thy Artist Murder, we might lose a listener. So we have to go back to playing Stone Temple Pilots. Like, Stone Temple Pilots is going to always be there. So why can't you guys break a new fucking band once in a while? And I think also a lot of bands play that serious XM octane card way too hard where it sounds so compressed and it's the same fucking structure for every single song on the radio. And it's so annoying. Yeah. The only band that's on the radio that sounds heavy, that's got good shit for the radio is Bad Wolves because Bad Wolves fucking knows how to bring it. One thing we'll say about the octane thing though is – one thing I've been seeing a lot from Octane, though, is and there's one guy that's kind of leading the charge on this with many different bands, but just creating a bunch of different like Facebook pages for these bands and then like um, igniting the flame behind them. They request the songs on Octane so that they have to play, like kind of like so that they are playing these smaller bands that wouldn't normally be noticed. Like there was one that I one of my favorite ones. They started out with uh, back. I think it was back in June. They had about maybe 10 or 11,000 Spotify listeners per month. They got one of their songs to be the top song on Sirius XM for two straight weeks. And now I'm going to pull it up because I know they're over 100,000 for uh, monthly listeners, but I don't know how far. 123. Wow. So just from that, it's it's yeah, there's definitely uh, there's definitely a um, like a mixture there. But I do totally understand what you're saying, what your management team is saying, because it's whatever is being played now. It just that was always one problem with the radio. Even when I was growing up too, before listening to Sirius, for I don't even listen to Sirius XM. I'm just follow everything that goes around there because I'm always listening to stuff that I want to listen to, stuff that I find. I'm not gonna let a radio DJ dictate what I'm gonna listen to because otherwise, you gotta, it, you gotta give credit to Liquid. Liquid Metal tries to play some different shit. They they play the, like the really obscure shit between Jose Manga and so on the Butcher. They're always trying to play some just some more just fucking necro gobblecon and just just the most acacia strain like this shit you would not hear on the radio they're always trying to push which is cool but there needs to be more people like that yeah and the problem is is there just aren't enough people like that to the point where if it's everyone's trying to make everyone's trying to just maintain what they have so it's like if you grow if you grow a certain fan base and all of a sudden it's like okay i want to keep growing this fan base but if i'm gonna keep growing it i have to keep playing the same stuff everyone else is so just to bring in more audience okay i i understand that but the problem is is you're losing some authenticity in there. You're losing a lot of it due to the fact that you're trying, you're starting to play more of what everyone else wants. So you're not starting to play stuff that is really part of your personality and what got you to where you're going. I get, you don't want to, it's, you don't, Oh, it's kind of like never forget where you were, but also I do understand where it comes to trying to grow. It's like, you can't always just rely on what you did. However, you kind of got to remember what you did as well. And still kind of, especially with the radio DJs, still play some of these more obscure bands because you never know what's going to end up being a hit. I know. I mean, look at Falling in Reverse. They didn't want to play Popular Monster, and they were forced to literally play. It's the number one song on active rock radio still. Months. Still. I mean, I think it's like on and off, but it's still number one. It's it's still and number one. they Falling in Reverse, but, they're ha- but they have to play Falling in Reverse. God forbid they play a fucking breakdown on the regular terrestrial rock radio anymore. Whatever happened to the radio being heavy? They used to play fucking Linkin Park and Slipknot and Disturb. And now that's like the heaviest they will go is like Disturb. I'm like, people make me sick. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I do like to hear Disturbed on the radio yes, every I, now I and do then. Too. They're, they're a great fucking band. They really are. Especially but, but I, oh, yeah. I mean, I almost got I almost got burnt. 
like the like both times I saw him because I was on the rail right by John Moyer and when they did Inside the Fire right when the solo hits and all of a sudden <laughs> all like these flames are coming up from the from the stage these little strands are coming down and they're just all on fire and I was right next to him just like <gasps> ah it's hot I was also kind of sick the oh. second time I saw them so it really kind of cleared up my sinuses a little bit yeah but that that is, like that is a rather big issue due to the fact that. I, I get, also get why they're doing it too, because industry trends are kind of going towards, especially with a younger generation. They're focusing a lot more on hip hop and rap just because that's what's more prominent, especially in culture right now. But the problem is, is there's such a, there's so many people still love that rock and metal sound. There are so many people out there, but it's just, and no one's really catering to that. Like Sirius is with XM Octane and, but it, it just, there's not enough of it. I mean, I listen to my local radio stations right now, if I ever do, and it's like, okay, there's two I would always used to listen to for stuff like this, especially like going to like this, like when I was in high school, going to school and stuff. The alternative one plays just the worst, most like just watered down crap ever. I mean, I pretty much wrote, I mean, this, that's where I felt that station was where I fell in love with Rise Against. I completely wrote that station off and I started playing AJR consistently. I was like, nope, I'm done. And then. <laughs> <laughs> and then this other one, it's they kept playing all the same like 80s and 70s rockets. I'm like, okay, can we get something new? And they started playing like, oh, we're going to play some some stuff that recently came out. And I'm like, okay, what are they going to play? And it's just, it's it's not heavy at all. I'm like, and the heaviest they've gone is like, um, I think they played, honestly, I think they just played the Sound of Sounds covered by Disturbed. That was like the heaviest they gone. I'm like, guys, no. It's, I, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait for Halloween. I'm gonna see if I can just like spam them and start trying to have them play "It Is the End" by Ice Nine Kills just to oh fuck God, with them. That song is so good. That video. <laughs> oh God. Oh my God. That, I want to hire that guy for that video or girl, whoever did that video. I need to hire because that the trilogy of that fucking record is insane. Not even a trilogy. It's a five parter because they did really, the American Night. It, yeah, because it was the American Nightmare was first. Then it was Thank God It's Friday. Then a grave mistake, then stabbing the dark, and they ended with it is the end. And then you got the little extra special ones with Mary Axe missing savages later down the line. Stabbing the dark is fucking god tier, and that song is so good. It's got it's like that what we were talking about like no breakdowns anymore, like that you can't play them on the on, on radio. They played stabbing the dark with that breakdown. Holy shit. What's that? Um, what's the Jaws song called? The record where they're uh, playing? rocking the boat. Yeah, that, that song is amazing how they have the breakdown intertwined with the Jaws noises. It's great. Oh, God, yeah. And then one thing I do want to see, too, especially in the future, is I know that that whole entire Five Finger Death Punch tour was happening with Ice Nine Kills on it. And then Trivium was going to be with uh, opening for Megadeth, I think. Yeah, with Lamb of God and Flames. And God. What I'd love to see is just because... On the um bo- or the uh, extended edition of the Silver Scream, they did a acoustic version of Stab in the Dark with Matt Heafy featured. But I'm like, I don't want to hear that acoustic. I want to hear Matt like full force in on it, especially just do the cool. intro. Holy shit. Like that is like Matt has like a haunting kind of style of vocal for that. He does. He really does. Yeah, you know, he he's improved so much of your style. I'll never forget when he stopped screaming for a couple of years, a couple of years ago when he had those vocal problems. And I was like, well, this is the end of Trivium. And then he came back, but they didn't say anything. Like he slowly, and I met him and I was talking to him after I saw him. I was like, dude, I'm like, when did you start screaming again? He's like, um, a few months ago, he's like, we're like slowly working it back. And so he's like, he's like, Mike, I'm telling you, he's like, I, I fucking miss it so much. He's like, <laughs> he's like, it, and it rounds the sound so much better. And then, Seeing him now scream and his singing is fucking phenomenal. And then Alex Bent is a monster on the drums. That that Alex Bent changed that thing for the better. He really did. Yeah, and like he, just watch like I mean, watch the video for Sin in the Sentence, just because they focus oh in God. on the intro. They just focus in on Alex on the drums the whole entire time, basically. And because uh, unlike Matt, he's been doing drums for 12 years. I did drums from when I was like 10 to 14. So I was trying to follow along with some of that shit. And I'm just sitting there thinking, what the hell is this guy doing? Like, how? It like it, it amazed me as, almost as much as when I saw Rush live with Neil Peart. It was that close. I'm like, how the fuck is this happening? Yeah. Fucking Rush. <laughs> yeah, man. Rip. Rip. Anyway, I, I, wasn't, I, was, I didn't know I was going to be able to bring up Rush on the podcast today, but I'm good yeah. with it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> but how about this, guys? How, because I'm taking a look at the time, and I'm like, we just basically went for an hour without even discussing anything with Cold Blooded Volume One. I know. And we, we could go on for hours at the music industry. <laughs> we literally could. <laughs> Honestly, we could have like that, like Joe Rogan, like Post Malone style podcast oh that just God. goes on for yeah, more hours. So Posty and fucking Joe Rogan. Or, or we could, or we could do what they do with what do you do with Alex Jones and have like six hours, just break it up into two three hour episodes. <laughs> right? Oh my god. I don't remember if I listen. I listened to part of that one. After a while, I'm like, Alex, I'm just getting way, way too out there for me. Even I'm like, I think it was after like two and a half hours. I'm like, okay, I can't even get to the second part of this. This is gonna be. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I was, I was burnt out from it. I think Joe Rogan was on. Um, fuck, what, what kind of drug was he on when he had post line? Was on like D, DMT. That's what it was. He was on DMT, and he just and Joe Rogan's like. The entire fucking episode. <laughs> I love Joe Rogan. Too. He's so great, Joe Rogan. I try to watch all of them, but there's so many. And there's so, it's so I know. His one with Travis Barker is my favorite. Oh, fuck Travis Barker. <laughs> I, I, when it comes to his podcast, it's, I I listen to some of the Travis Barker one. I remember when he had uh, Mayor James Keenan and I listened to that whole entire thing because I was like, okay, when's the new tool I'm coming out? Because I have to get re- ready to review that and do all this shit. It was just like he. It was just like in the first like five minutes. That's all they they focus on that. And then it was like, okay, no more tool after that. And it yeah. pissed off a lot of people because it's like, well, that's all we wanted to hear about. I'm like, well, they gave you what you wanted in the first five minutes. You can't be too pissed at that, right? It's yeah. like, how much more do you want at that point, right? Yeah, well, but I think it's time we discuss Cold Blooded Volume. What's the camera? One. Yeah. We'll discuss Cold Blooded Volume One. So, because you guys had five songs in there, you had Broken Life, Meth Man, Burn Our Memories, Shook Into the Core, and Releasing the Poison on there as well. And taking a look at Spotify right now, once I go back from where I was looking up my good old Kingdom Collapse stuff. I mean, Shook Into the Core is the one that you guys have over 10,000 streams on right now on mm-hmm. Spotify. So when it comes to that uh, new management team that you had, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, just take a look at the numbers again. It, it, it definitely worked, and I can see why it yeah, worked. Because- and, you, and you know what? Our thing was with the first record or so, we kind of put the singles on what we thought was a strong one. Like, we picked why. We knew why it was, it was kind of a no-brainer. But, and, you know... I don't. Did we tell you we won an award for why or no? No, you didn't tell me any of that shit. We won this Academa um, Greek Rock Song of the Month for February 2020. We're like, wow, never did I think a song with the letter Y would win a fucking award, but yeah. it did. Yeah. So we have that on a part of our resume now. But um, what we did for this record is, you know we in the past picked the singles and we really on this record we tried pushing like greedy bitch was a was a big hit so it was why obviously a nightmare never ending and slaves featuring franz you know we ended up trying to push drowning in myself with spineless like really hard and people just kind of just wait just wait i want to throw it fuck it (laughs) fucking people keep calling me is it, um, is it Eric? Or no? Yeah. So, you know, I think, um, I think our biggest thing was picking what the people wanted to hear for the first time, like letting in it. See, it worked out well with COVID because we were able to take a step back with the numbers and look, we're like, okay, like people really like broken life, but they really like sugar the core the most. And, you know, Shook in the core. I don't know what the streaming count is versus the other one, but definitely is the most popular song on the record. So we're like, okay, you know what? It, people like that yeah. song. That's going to be the lead single. That's going to be the lead single. It's going to be the next single. So we did Broken Life last year, and Broken Life people really, really liked. And people seem to really like Meth Man, which this man wrote with me. So, you know, and we thought Burn Our Memories and Releasing the Toys would go well. Like they um they went well, but the other three went a lot better. You need my phone. <laughs> kinda 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 need the phone. I just threw threw against the wall. Someone keeps calling me. <laughs> well, even like I was taking a look at like just some of the stuff that we did as well. And then because I remember the day it came out, I put it as one of the songs of the song of the day. I couldn't remember which one it was, but it was Burn Our Memories. I remember yeah. that was the one because you, you were like, Yeah, can you do Burn Our Memories? And I just looked, I said, Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> 
gosh. Like it was, it was nothing where I'm like, okay, you know, we got it's just I because I don't even think you had me. You think you like told me which one to pick, and then you sent the album to me. So yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna roll with that because that was said, gonna, that was gonna be the single. We even had artwork drawn up for it, and then the streaming numbers like they just didn't move the needle, and I was like, um, okay, it was just like you know. Uh, if you guys like the other ones, we gotta go with what the what the people like, you know. And ironically, move the needle. There's a song on volume two called Pass the Needle, ironically. So <laughs> but um, you know, I think I think the biggest thing for this re- release what we learned. <laughs> uh make sure you have make sure you never have this go on when you do an interview with someone, Kevin, where someone calls you like 27 fucking times. And I even turned the phone off. People say, I turned my phone off and they still keep calling me. Is, how is he calling you with, even with your phone? Are you calling someone else or is I saw me and with... it's coming through the MacBook. That's my problem. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank God we figured out how to turn off the ringer. So it stopped. So it wouldn't ring. Cause we did an interview Monday with this guy named, um, Brandon who does this, um, podcast called audio addiction from from uh pennsylvania and the entire time my phone kept going off, I was like, dum, 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 <laughs> and it got really fucking annoying but moving back to the topic of generation underground's new album volume one whole bunch of volume one actually um you know broken life was actually well in the correct order of how these songs are written so shook me to the core was written first out of all these songs we ended up, the crazy thing is we ended up writing that song, all the lyrics with, we wrote the both verses within like an hour and a half from scratch. No, just straight from scratch. And then wrote the chorus like the next morning. And the song is about losing someone close to you. And I was writing about losing my dog and losing my grandmother. And ironically, the next day that she did pass, I wrote it right after it. I was like, I'm never going to feel this type of way ever again. So I might as well get it out. And for me personally, it's a good like send off almost, but it's also, I'm very happy people really like this song because that song means a lot to me. And I'm very happy people that really gravitate towards that. And so that was the first song we, that we wrote for volume one. The second song we wrote was Broken Life, which we wrote, um, we started demoing it after our release. I was just playing as a riff. I was like, you know, I'm like, this kind of reminds me of like, Deftones. I'm like, I kind of like this. And we just, we just built on it. And we finished that one in December of uh, that year. And then we did Meth Man, the, the one that everyone's always like, what's it about? What's it about? What's it about? Well, Broken Life is about people around me that have been, have had, you know, abusive parents, a parent die in front of them, you know, divorce, betrayal, cheating, the whole nine yards. And we kind of, took that and we rolled it in the meth man and meth man is about a sound guy we had for remember the show in atlantic city shustler yeah with vaughn yeah our sound guy was on meth was literally on fucking meth he would come to he would come do sound and when he would come do sound he would he was he let's say we got there like two o'clock we'd see him for a half hour and go back inside <laughs> see him for a half hour go back inside we're like what the fuck's the pattern and the guy just comes out and it's like, you know, I want to say like 90 degrees. That was, it was a little hot, but it wasn't too bad. And he, I'm not joking. Like he comes back out and this dude was like, he went for like, a dip in the fucking like, Atlantic ocean. Literally caked in sweat. Yeah. <laughs> just dripping. And it's dripping on your drum kit. We're like, what the hell's going on? I, know, I was like, no, but the, no, the best part was his wife. The wife walks in. One foot flop on with a limp and goes, you got to move that shit or what? And I'm like, oh, my God, what the hell we got ourselves into? <laughs> what and after the, the whole line, meth looking sound man with his hoe came from. <laughs> so, and and that wasn't even like, a, there was only like, you know, 20 people there at the show. Like, yeah, like, like we came on like six hours late. We missed we missed going to see a little pump that night because we were so fucking late getting on stage. But you know that was a real that, that song at all has the most interesting backstory and the song originated from one of his solo songs that we just reworked into one of our songs so you still have that up on youtube uh, no actually i took that down damn that's a shame <laughs> i got the video saved though. okay that's cool 
And then um, as long as the video is still there, that's all that matters. Then you can put yeah. it back up there and then everyone kind of compare the two. It's like, so this is the original. Right. And then we reworked it into Meth Man. And also Here that story is freaking insane. It, it, it's fucking unbelievable. It really is. And then Burn Our Memories was about a person who used to be in this band who was an in the band, in the band, you know, he's been in oh. the band four times. He was the one that convinced us to put the band back together again. And last year when he left us hung and dry in the middle of our tour, it really pissed me off. So I wrote a song about it, which was just brutally honest of cry like a bitch. I'm a stupid ass snitch. My deadbeat dad give me no attention so I can go get my depression. Like that was, I don't think I've ever been that fucking angry towards a take, but I was, I was really, <laughs> really pissed off with that song, but really came out good. And then release of the poison, was about me kicking a few people including that person who is now a part of my life again um out of my life and it just you know it goes for anyone trying to get rid of the toxic nonsense that people bring with them in your lives do you like look people suck that's the bond people suck you gotta pick and choose what people will suck with and some people they're just not worth your time it's it's so it's like it's like uh oh let me that is uh sorry guys that's a re- hey guys looks like we're having some yeah we just kind of cut out for a little bit for about maybe like 10 seconds i think do you want me to talk about releasing the poison again yeah just uh just a re- just a restart it because i did hear you were saying no about it was like getting rid of the toxic people in your life so that's kind of okay. where we that's kind of all of a sudden like yeah time i mean to elaborate on okay yeah, so you can start there, I guess. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, to elaborate, Kevin, on what we were saying about releasing the poison, it's about, you know, pushing the toxic people and the nonsense out of your life. And, you know, people definitely understand, like, you can always fix things if you want to. Like, there's always a solution to be found. This is what people are trying to get to that point and, you know, willing to go down the dark fucking hole of what people are willing to go to. And, you know... Well, they just gotta go. Like it's just that something. Some people just they just suck and they gotta go. And that's what that song was. I was uh, kicking out people out of my life that needed to fucking go. Completely need to go. Oh, I totally understand so. that hundred percent. I mean, I d- had to deal with something like that a couple of times, and there was one where it was it was oh god, it was it was something I got I got sucked into so bad for a number of years. And weirdly enough, it was right when this whole entire quarantine thing started, the whole COVID-19, all the shutdown shit started. This is where like a song like this can really stick out in your head because and there's a couple other songs, too, that I've heard over the course of this year that also kind of deal with stuff like that. One of my favorites also being Erase Me by Make Them Suffer because it's about vi- pretty much the same thing as well. But it was this person, she like she messaged me saying that it's something about like how I was appearing in her dreams. Oh, that nice. oh, that she God. should reconnect with me oh, and wow. that she missed me and all this kind of crap nice. you want you want to know what i did yes do, do tell i do because yeah. it, it, it was this was, it was this long like three string text kind of thing and i was looking at it and i because sh- i was living with my best friend that time because this was at the end of march i showed it to him and we just started laughing hysterically and he's like, what are you going to do? I'm like, you want to know what I'm going to do? Here's what I'm going to do. I had my phone in my hand. I just I just turned it off. I went and did something else. I've, I, I still have that text on my phone, but I have never responded to it. Like, I have not left it. But the, because the reason is because when I think about it, when, like, I was hanging out with this person, it was there were there were times where it's like, yeah, times were fun at times. But the problem was, was those type of people that are very toxic for you that are going to kind of keep you down, they're going to only allow you to have your ceiling in life be so high. Right. And yeah. I've seen where without having that person in my life, that my ceiling was way above where they, where that person ha- was going to allow me yeah. to go. And at the point when they messaged me, I was already above that point. So I'm like, why the fuck would I go back to that? Why would I be like, Oh yeah, come back in and uh, just basically back down to where I was. Yeah, why the fuck would I let someone do that? <laughs> hey, you know, we have a former bass player who we he was originally on. I'm tired of fucking. I'm tired of holding my fucking tongue. I was going to tell the fucking story on the air. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, this well, our friend who was on our betrayal originally was moved off of our betrayal for Pablo 
Viveros. Viveros. Yeah, Viveros. And he didn't exactly like that we did that. Now I might add to everybody before I go, oh, you guys are fucking assholes. He quit the band four times, four different times, and left us hung and dry four separate times for excuses of hanging with his friends, shop right training, <laughs> not answering the phone, being pussy whipped by his stupid girlfriend, and a multitude of other fucking stupid reasons. And, you know, I try to have some decency in my life to call him and tell him, hey, you know, look, you're not a song anymore. And instead of understanding, it's like, you know, you guys are always fucking self-centered and, you know, you're not seeing it from my perspective. Today, Kevin, he has called me 23 fucking times. As I say that again, 23 times. Oh, it's that guy? It's that guy. 23 times. I turned my phone off. I threw it in the other room and he still keeps calling. He called me on like a regular phone call, Snapchat, Instagram, and he started FaceTiming. What's going to be next? Skype? Zoom. Zoom? Skype? Is he going to join the Zoom call? That, wouldn't that be funny? No, that be, be, if, if he, I'll say, it, if he somehow had that information and had the passcode to get in, if he was able to do that, <laughs> would you guys want me to bring him on? <laughs> At that point, almost, at that point, yeah. it would be probably your most viewed episode ever. I would be, yeah, I would say yeah. I'm, I'm not sure because my most viewed episode right now was with a band from New York called Fear Is Dead, where we just talked about a bunch of like uh, how, a bunch of just like um hip hop mix with punk rock and like how the uh, vocal style is very much spoke like uh, spoken word poetry mm-hmm. mixed in with punk rock. So I was like, I'm surprised I went up, but. If I marketed that, if I mar- if that happened where he joined in on the Zoom call and I marketed it right, holy crap, that could be like that could be Joe Rogan esque. That that could be Joe Rogan and be- Elon Musk smoking weed together. That could be that kind of a moment. Oh my god! Yeah, nothing beats the Elon Musk we- meme when he's like, "What's yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, shit?" He kind of uh, looks like looks like I mean, Robert De Niro, just like, yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> That's good there. Yeah, I mean, look, at, at this point of our career, we're just trying to better our own career. And you know what? If bands around this area... Oh, there it is again. There it is again. Number 24, <laughs> Kevin. 24. We're at 24 already. I got, I mean, we might have to have, like, a counter. I might have to go through this again and have, like, a counter going every time he calls us. Like, bing, bing. Play a SpongeBob clip where it says, fucking, uh, Patrick, what's funny? You're in 24. Uh, 25. 25. 25. <laughs> Five minutes later. 25. <laughs> we see like one of those time cards that have Patrick holding it and saying he called so many times we ran out of time cards. Oh, fuck. <laughs> oh yeah. Patrick, do you have any more time cards? Oh, oh. Exactly. need more time for thinking. Yeah, exactly. Oh, we have dear. more time for thinking. We have technology. Oh, <laughs> oh my god, I can go on for hours about that show. But oh, yeah. anyway, um, yeah, you know, look, we, we, we're we very happy where we stand. People keep fucking calling me and, you know, like they don't <laughs> understand that the three of us are what is Generation Underground. We have a great publicist, you know, with uh, digital. Oh, God damn it. Let me get his let me let me get his plug right. Hold on. Let me let me get it right. Let me not fuck up Adam's shit. Hold on. Yeah, let's, um, let's, let's make sure we get this plug right, because we want to make sure that especially with what they've done for you guys so far, we want to make sure that it's correct. So if other bands are listening, yeah. they're looking for a management team that's going to help them out or a publicist team that's going to help them out. We want to make sure that they get the correct information. Um, his name is Adam Ramey. You can shoot him a message on Instagram, and his company is called Push Digital Marketing. I couldn't tell you. Got t ah, hundred dollars. I think four. Shoot, it's cutting out again. It doesn't matter what your budget is. Well, enough seems like we you know. It cut out, didn't it? Yeah, I was cutting out a little bit. All this, pretty much what I got of that was it doesn't matter what your budget is. So, I, I honestly, I think that if there was one part of that that was not going to cut out, that was the part that you needed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, pretty much like looking at his different prices, there's different options for his from... God, where the hell is it? Thousand dollar plan, five hundred dollar plan, four hundred dollars, two fifty. Like there is, there's a plan for everybody, and 
he's looking for more clients to take on. And, you know, if you're in a band, you want to have your music pushed further and further. He's definitely the guy to go with. And, you know, he, I can't say enough positives about him. And he's just, it's nice to have somebody get it and like be sit, willing to sit there and, you know, to help you figure out what to do. Cause it's, you know, it's music's like a very, it's, um, making music that's the easiest part it's learning everything else that comes with this the hard part between marketing it and promoting it and the shows and selling tickets selling tickets is a fucking oh my god yeah. it's a struggle just wait till covid ends trying to sell tickets to be even fucking harder to sell i, f- I feel like it was gonna, especially once covid ends there's gonna be an initial push because of how many people are gonna want to go and get and go to concerts but the problem is going to be with just how many shows are going to be out there because of how many bands are holding off right now because of that it's like a double-edged sword you can't you can't win it's like you know um how it's like how do you approach it's like do you do a lot of shows do you do a little bit and like we don't know how the market's gonna be i don't know like people might want to be i'll throw fucking throw four hundred dollars for a ticket that's great and some people were like, I'm not leaving my house until there's um, a vaccine, which is totally justifiable. So, like, you have to, like, at this point, us complaining about it isn't going to solve anything. So we just got to kind of let, let, the, let the cards fold out and just see what happens. Yeah, and it's, it's all going to depend upon different, well, the market and what every person that attends concerts is going to want. Because I think it was, shoot, what was this? It was something that kind of uh, I saw from... John Taffer, the bar rescue guy, where he was I talking John about. Taffer. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, when it comes to the, your buddy calling you, you're just gonna have to send him like a picture of John Taffer that just says "shut it down." I think you'll get the message. <laughs> but he had this thing out where it was like reopening bars, and it was like there are three different types of crowds. It was like the value crowd, the the middle ground crowd, and the certain crowd. The value crowd is like they love going to the bar so much, like that's what they love to do. So right when the bar is able to open, that crowd is going to go and go right out there. They're not going to care about what else is going on in the world. They're not going to care about if there's a vaccine or not. They're just going to want to go back to what they did because that's what they really care about. Then you get the middle ground crowd where they're going to wait out a couple of weeks or a couple of months just to see how everything goes to get more comfortable. But then you're going to get that real reserve crowd or that real like risk, like that real risk of uh yeah risk averse crowd. They're like, we're not going to go out until we get a vaccine. We're not going to do that. It's going to be the same thing with music as well. Same thing with going to concerts. Whereas you're going to get people like myself who once concerts are able to come back, like you're going to see me in a mosh pit. And if my face gets beat up again, it gets beat up again. I don't care. I've been to Art. one show since the whole entire shutdown happened. It was a smaller show up in Green Bay, Wisconsin for the band Gold Frankenstein's and Mercs. I've worked with the girls a couple of times, had them on the podcast. I was supposed to see them three times this year. It was the first time I saw them. And it felt so good to be back. Just even though it was a smaller show, there were a couple, like 12 people trying to start a little mosh pit up in front. I'm like, this is going to be fun because I miss it. It was a great time. I, I, next morning, my neck was super stiff because I was just headbanging as much as I possibly could as well. And then yeah. early in September, two bands I've had in the podcast, one's called Relent, one's called The Protest. They're playing a show up in northern Wisconsin. And I'm like, it's on a Tuesday, guys. You got to be kidding me. Wait, I have the whole week off from work. This is great. <laughs> so I'm going to go and see it. I, I yeah. like I'm definitely part of that crowd where it's like if it's like I'll, I'll use Rise Against an example. If Rise Against was able to come back to Milwaukee and they were charging like 200 bucks a ticket, I would not bat an eye to go and get, get a ticket for that because I mean, I'm like I'm so that was in Rage it. Against the Machine when they announced the reunion. It was like we paid a hundred and thirty dollar ticket, but they were tickets going on the floor was like four hundred fucking dollars. But it's like it's Rage. Like like you don't know with Rage if it's ever going to happen again. So you better go. Yeah, that was one of my buddies, his idea, because he went he was gonna go to the one in uh Minneapolis and I was gonna try and hit up the one that they were gonna play at uh this outdoor venue here in Wisconsin called Alpine Valley. It's about a okay. half hour, forty minutes away from Milwaukee. So I was gonna try and hit that up, but I think I might have been I might have been going to Rockfest at that time as well here in Wisconsin. But I'm hoping that happens next year due to the fact that I'm renting a Winnebago, going there and bringing all my shit with me. And then I'm also going to have like a shit ton of coolers in the Winnebago, like beer, mix, like I'll have a good amount of liquor, water, Gatorade, anything, soda on ice. And I'm going to try and get as many bands to come to the Winnebago as possible. Sit, chill for like 10, 15 minutes. You guys want something to drink? Hey, I got anything you want. So I'm sit down, have a relax for a little bit because, well, if you're going to be at those shows, the likelihood that they're going to be like, hey, you're backstage. Hey, can I get a beer? Yeah, it's probably gonna be hard to find. Just come by me. I'm gonna have, and not only that, but I'm gonna have good shit. Like that's the thing. That's also very true. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna make my spot a destination. 
but the destination festival, but it says des- it's Kevin's destination trailer of beverages. Yeah, because I brought up to a couple of bands, and there were a couple of bands that were really down for it. The one I brought up to that was like when I told them about it, it was super in was the band Blacktop Mojo. Like they were like, holy I've shit, we were guys before. They're like, holy shit, we'd love to do that. Just make sure you have spotted cow. I'm like, okay. I, got, I wrote down the list. I'm like, it's in my brain. There, <laughs> I'm gonna have like five or six coolers in this Winnebago plus my shit. It's it's gonna be somewhere. This is gonna be a four day thing where I'm gonna end up running solely on adrenaline, Red Bull, and probably this pre workout my buddy has that has deer stag in it. Nice. Just just like a piece of the yeah, they just shaved off parts of the antler and just put it in the pre workout. I've heard of a lot of uh, my friend Alex is a lot of pre workout shit, but that sounds that's extreme. I, I gotta talk to him. I see him tonight about deer. It was deer stag. Deer stag. Like the, oh my God. There, there was this deer stag, deer antler, stag antler. I don't remember what it exactly it was called, but like I've seen my buddy take it, and when he's lifting, his he literally looks like he has Parkinson's. That's how like wired he is. He's just shaking like crazy and amped up. I'm like, I'm, especially when I do this whole entire like Winnebago idea, I need that just to, especially after day three, because I can I function a couple of times where it's like I've gotten like an hour or two of sleep and then went through the whole entire next day and did some like absolutely crazy shit. But then again, I was in a completely different country and. Beer and weed helped out a little bit, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Understandable. All right, but jumping back into, again, cold blood because that's why we're here, because it seems like every time we start talking about it, we always just end up going Joe Rogan style and just going way, way. We've done like almost like a figure eight where we start here and we go like this and we come down here and we go over here and like, yeah. <laughs> we're not talking about this or this. We're talking about this. <laughs> going all SpongeBob again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And there's a there's a SpongeBob meme for anything now. Yes, it, 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 the, my favorite is the SpongeGar. SpongeGar? Yeah, the when he was um they went back to fucking BC and it, it wasn't before Christ, it was before comedy. Oh he's yeah, wearing like, he's wearing like the little the little cloth and Squidward tries to pull it off and it's just another cloth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my god. Dude. And then they, and, oh yeah, and they look at Patrick's mouth and it's just like this like it kind of looks like Homer Simpson, but just like a whole bunch of teeth coming out of there. It's just like and there's fungus everywhere. It's just like ooh. Might have to just add like random like SpongeBob memes to the video. All of a sudden, just like keep getting we people should. watching. Just boom, boom. Every minute, just a different one. Just change it over, change it over, change it over. <laughs> All right, but okay, back to what we God, I gotta keep this on topic a little bit more just to <laughs> so we're getting so I wanna start out I wanna start by talking about shook into the core because that is your most popular on Spotify right now. And when it comes down to it, it's oh if it's the most popular, that's the one people are gonna want to listen to. So let's talk about it. I mean, I went in deep with this song to really try and understand what I thought of it, but when it came down to it, I mean, we already talked about like what the inspiration was behind it, but when it came to writing this song, if you remember, what was the idea behind the construction of the sound of it? I think, um, you know, we've always had an idea of like what we're looking for, but that song really started with um, my friend Matt Balaco had a riff that he had laying around like the chorus. If he had laying around, he wrote like on... Um, he wrote it like the previous Halloween before uh, before we did the song. And, you know, it always kind of stood around there. And I was like, this is something about this riff. It just doesn't go away. And it's going to be used for something. We kind of, we took that and we built on it. And then we kind of just fucked around and we're like, all right, like what chords would work and what don't work. And, you know, originally the song started off with it having guitar at the beginning, not just bass where it was just bass out. But then we decided like, well, you know, we haven't tried with just a bass intro and then into the drums. And, you know, I really think that um, the finger tapping guitar solo that I played at the end was a real, real different spin on things. We, we never did it like that before. It was like very technical, but it was still like very heavy and to the point. And our music video, we just did, we just spent how many hours to spend fucking headbanging? Four, four. I don't know. It, it, the motto and the name of our group chat is one more take because our director Mike Monza kept saying, "Come on, no, nope, one more take, one more take, no, 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 do it again, do it again, <laughs> nope, nope, do it again." And I could do a lot of head banging, but for four hours straight, it, you really, really run out of energy physically and mentally. But 
I will say we do know the song really well now, That's really true. well. So <laughs> that might have been the whole entire really idea behind it. Video. We break we in the music video we break guitars, TVs, mirrors, pots or no, it wasn't pots. Uh, well, like lampshade yeah. and coffee mugs and oh my god it was just to purify the structure i have the battle scars to show it like i got cut here i got a cut here so mm-hmm. you know it um it, only my mom could drag out two hours and the four hours of breaking she's like come on dude circle the fucking tv 26 times i'm like why i'm like this is not fucking this yeah, is not the strip club like you don't tease it fucking 26 <laughs> times Oh my god, that's great. We're gonna, we're gonna get killed for this interview. Yeah, it's okay though. I mean it sounds like you guys like literally shot this in, like the music video in like a rage room where it's just they're giving you like you have a bunch of old stuff out there. They're gonna give you a bunch of like bats and weapons, you're just gonna break the hell out of it. Just I have fuck. to give a lot of props to Goodwill. We bought all of our props at Goodwill and I gotta say they make some pretty good quality shit, Goodwill, for selling. Like it uh, that shit took a while to break. It really did. <laughs> But when it broke, oh, it was fucking brutal. It was yeah. bad for dust and glass. And, you know, we only finished the, the video two days before doing this interview with you. So that we were literally talking about this interview when we were doing the shoot and just, you know, sitting around waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. But you know what? Like people, when they see this video, they'll be very, very happy with what they're getting. So. So the, your director with the constantly one more take, one more take, one more take. And again, it's, it did have its benefits to the point where you guys know the song incredibly well now, but also with all those different takes, they're, they're able to look through so many different ideas of how to get this video to be constructed. Yeah. So when it comes out, I mean, you're going to have this thing where it's just going to really, really stick out in the minds of fans. He's a great guy. You know, he, his company's called uh, Burning Wick Studios. He's a like- a great job. If you want a director that wants to sit there and go through each detail and get it right, get the right take, he's definitely the right guy. But for us, after four hours, my patience is pretty fucking thin for the shit like that. And, you know, the video does come out very well, but there's a lot of extra takes, which is good for behind the scenes. It's still a lot of takes to fucking do. So, but I do respect his whole mindset of like, let's get it right. So it looks good in the video. You got to respect that. So, well, then talking about like another artist that we brought up earlier, can you imagine with those Ice Nine Kills videos, how many takes it took to get oh, those I, down? I, I, I don't even want to think about it. It already hurts my head thinking about <laughs> it. <laughs> but, but then again, the reason I also bring that up too is just take a look at all of those videos with how well they came out and with how well everything was constructed. I, I mean, I mean, God, we talk about how it is the end, how that video is just one of the most insane things ever. When all of a sudden you just see Spencer Turnus looking like a fucking clown, literally a fucking clown. And then the whole entire just different like cuts they made with everybody and doing all this other weird crap as well. I mean, it, it worked out to perfection because it's a 15 minute video where I'm not not going to lie. When people put out 15 minute music videos, it's a lot of times people will watch part of them just for the just for the music part and that's it that's a video where i've gone back numerous and numerous of times to watch not only the like what was going on when they're uh just playing the song but the before and after is all because of how well it's constructed in the whole entire arc of it and then not only that but gone through the first four as well to really get the story down because it's i mean it's a mini movie in itself it really is and that's definitely a band i've noticed severe said definitely it's Spencer's project, it's Spencer's band. He's got one hell of a vision, that guy. I've had a just it's theatricals. They're just insane. How like they have everything. They're all, I almost call it like the male version of like Maria Brink, how they have everything so choreographed with like the outfits and the stage props and what everyone does. I think Ice Nine Kills is the most underrated feature is the backing vocals. Like they have all those guys sing and it just rounds up the sound so much stronger live. It really does. Well, even on the studio ones, well, before all those other guys were on there, when it was just him and uh, Justin Debilic that were doing the, that was Justin doing the backing vocals, just because he could scream with a, like a higher pitch, and it just worked out so well. Like, take a look at a song like from their uh, Prayer vs. the Prey album, "Let's Bury the Hatch in Your Head." I listen to that song all the time, and it's just the mixture of vocals is perfect down there. But I love what you kind of ta- brought up with like the whole entire kind of the like the male maria brinking away with just the vision and just how everything is choreographed the one difference i will say is is because i've seen both shows live from in this moment and ice nine kills 
I Ice Nine kills Bulls Malware because it's just there's much more energy going on. And there's much more freedom on stage because I, when I'm watching in this moment, it's a lot more choreographed. It's a lot more structured, which I do get people really do like that for myself, though. I thrive off of that just pure energy. I thrive off of that like spontaneity. I thrive off that craziness. So when I saw them, it was just something completely and utterly ridiculous. I think if in this moment did less costume changes and kept the momentum going, it would benefit them more. Oh my god, I yeah. Feel I feel like that their shows have so many peaks and values. It's like one song out, one song out. I like guess and it's like and then you got fucking bear to be just like this the entire show. It, <laughs> it gets more intense as the show goes on. Yeah, because when I because in this moment I saw I've seen them twice. It was they were in a headlining tour at the begin middle of 2019 with uh, and they had Seven Dust opening for them. And when I saw that show, I like Seven Dust much more because it was such a yeah. much more consistent flow of the show. Seven Dust has arrived. <laughs> yeah, and it was like it, and and it was somewhere and they were up there. They didn't have as much movement on the stage, I would like, but I mean, still they brought it. It was in, it was a great time. I had, I had a blast during in this moment. Said it was just the constant costume changes just really drew me out of it. But then I saw them a second time when they opened for Disturbed on the last part of the Disturbed Evolution tour last year. And that mm-hmm. was a huge complaint from all the fans that I was around was it was you in this moment. I mean, they've got great music, but I didn't really care for their last album, though. I'm not going to lie. But when it comes down to it, it's just all the different costume changes and just how it broke up the show. It's just it really just made it drag on more than you thought it w- it should. And it's just that momentum that all of a sudden you're playing a song and all of a sudden you're gone for a whole minute and then you're coming out with a brand new costume. But just that whole minute every single time is completely killer. Versus, I'll use Ice Nine Kills as an example on this. When I saw him, it was because the costume changes that they had there with Spencer, it was they were all really quick. So it was like when a song ended, all of a sudden he goes back to go put on the whole entire like ghost face from Scream. They start playing the song and they have the girl that looks like Drew Barrymore come out. So you're already so there's still something going on. The right, only time there's always something going on. Yeah, the only time there was a major lapse was it was at the end of the set. They played 18 songs at this point, and then they went out. But it was like a six seven minute interval, so we were wondering if there was going to be an encore or not. All of a sudden, they started playing. It is the end. I'm like, okay, but he came out in the full clown garb, like it, like oh, he was wow. full Spencer Wise the clown. And then we saw that and everyone's like, okay, now this makes total sense why we had to wait this long. But it's just something where it was that was at the that was from the end of the show to the encore. So that break was already built in there. Yeah, and I know some like that Seether does, they like play guitar tracks between the songs so they don't lose the momentum. It doesn't go like really quiet. And like something I wish that something like a band like Event Sevenfold would do would be like the evening with that Machine Head does. It's fucking three hours of Machine Head. Like it's the best way I can explain to people is if you love Machine Head, oh, it's great. Because I'm, I'm like, you know, Rob Flynn be like, yo, we haven't played this song in 26 fucking years. Get in the pit, bitch, now. But, like, it's great for me knowing all the deep cuts. I, I fucking love Machine Head. But what they did, I saw them in January. They did, um, like, 16, 17 songs. Took a 10-minute break, and they came out. They played Burn My Eyes front to back. I was like, this is perfect. Fucking God. Oh, and look. all right, Kevin. We have reached the, the magic number twenty-five. <laughs> twenty-five. <laughs> oh my uh, god, this is insane. This is insane. This is like full-blown, like fucking stalking at this, this point. This is like this is like psychotic girlfriend, like from the one from uh, cause was one person I was hanging out with. Her, she loved ninety day fiance just for the shit show it was, and there was one that she oh, showed me where it was just like some some woman just kept calling her ninety day fiance. It was like, come home now, and every time you'd hang up, like five seconds later, all of a sudden, call again, call again, call again. It's like this is what's happening here. You know, you think you would understand by like the fifth call, like they're not picking the fucking phone up, and it's not even like I'm trying to ignore him. It's just we've had a very busy day trying to land the Pablo. Say it again, everybody. Viveros. 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 Pablo Viveros, guest <laughs> feature. Trying to land some other guest feature. He may be in that same band. I, I, I may into that. He, he may be in the same band. I'm going to float that out there. Um, We're not going to give certain names, though, because it's not confirmed yet. <laughs> it, it, I wish it was fucking confirmed. I'm waiting on a reply. So, um, but moving away from that for a second, you know. We always have busy days. We all do other things outside of the band. Like I have a po- I have a sport podcast. He does. He's in another band. He's in another band too, actually. Yeah. So like we all do other things. Like we have lives. It's like 
but we put all those things aside to do this bank. We know this is this is going to work the best for all of us. So you know, but um, you know, I think a lot of bands like Code Orange, that band, there's never a break. Like, I know Jamie takes a break like every like 25 minutes. So there's like, okay, this is for all the hardcore kids from 2012, and then they fucking just go out there, and then people are just getting the shit kicked out of them in the fucking pit. Like you need like people thrive off anger. Maybe oh yeah, really, you know, anger. Whether it's like in a slow, depressing way or a fast, just mm-hmm. pissed off. Like people thrive off of anger, and I think Code Orange is a good example of a band that just they don't stop. They do. They just keep going and going. And by the time the show's over, you're like, "What the fuck? Did I just watch this. Is crazy. This is so yeah. much energy, pound for pound." <laughs> So it's like when you see hate breed and they step on stage and they hit the open fucking C note and then just, then the fucking floor is 90 feet wide already. And it's so <laughs> big, this big dude who's, you know, 45 years old who deadlifts 550 is in the, in the middle of the pit saying, bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Yeah. I've seen those guys, especially, um, well, that almost happened because there's one, I think there's one guy who was standing in the middle of wall of death for the breakdown with popular monster. when we did that. I was mad because I almost missed it because like, someone almost broke my fucking nose. But then they didn't, and they told me to leave it on our side. I'm like, and I found the guy that almost broke my nose. I'm like, you! And he just looked at me. He's like, <laughs> I just leveled his ass. <laughs> I was having too much fun with that. But also when it comes to live shows, it's there's so many different... It, it all depends on the band. It all depends on your style as well. And for a fan, it all depends on your preference. But like one live show that I can still distinctly remember where it came from just... That at like when it came to just the perfect kind of construction of it was this past year at Riot Fest with Rise Against because they they came out just guns blazing just playing that just all their high energy stuff I think they open up with a wolf so it just opens up a lot of high energy just the crowd it was massive just pushed to the front and I mean I was already up near the front so like it was you couldn't really move there were people passing out left and right the security couldn't get to them so we were just crowd surfing them to the front and there came a point in time where i thought i was going to pass out because there was really no air i was dying in there i saw someone form a little mosh pit over on the side over in the middle i'm like i was pointing i'm like just get me over there and i was happy for two reasons one a little bit more air a little bit cooler i'm good to go second reason there's actually a freaking mosh pit now and not just a bunch of people like pushing each other against the crowd and by the time when everyone in the pit was feeling like they're going to pass out all of a sudden, the show just went to kind of like came to like a nice abrupt halt. They played Swing Life Away and everyone kind of just got that like breather before three more he- like hard hitting songs. And it was just like the perfect time to bring in like a break in the action where if you have a show like you can constantly keep going balls to wall like Code Orange or Beartooth. But sometimes you can bring in like one of those like little breaks of the action if it's done correctly. We were literally talking about this um, Thursday at lunch about how like having like a little like peaks and valley and in, in like our show specifically makes yeah. a big difference. Having to take a break, even we can take a break and slow it down for a little bit and then build it right back up. You know, we, we've done acoustic songs live, like the song um, on the first sound called Final Stand. We played it live twice. We're just literally stopped the whole show and bust out the acoustic and played it. And it it's a cool, it's a different element. But I feel like that we've all come to the agreement that is a little bit too far with slowing it down because it kind of like, it's like, all right, we're going really fast. And it's like just complete stop. So we try to like dial it back a little bit here and there, but while keeping the energy up, because eventually like we did the summer slaughter tour last year for four days. Like we knew we had 20 minutes. It was shut up. You're not Ivan Moody. Shut up and keep playing the songs. Keep don't not talk. <laughs> introduce the song and play it just keep going and going and going and we were able to bust that what was it like uh um, set recording what i'm looking at we played five songs in 20 minutes that's good that's pretty good so three originals two covers right to the point so and people especially in Providence, rhode island fucking loved us especially during fucking you only live once they went absolutely buck shit crazy out there for that was like my favorite show probably of all time Rhode Island, people in Rhode Island. Mm. I don't know anything about Rhode Island other than Providence. <laughs> well, um, I mean, Dumb and Dumber starts out in Providence, so there um, you go. There you go. Most because I after I was working on a video for a band, uh, I was reviewing their album. Uh, it's called the uh, Ghost in the Shadows by the band Rebelmatic. I was reviewing their album. I had uh, Dumb and Dumber on the background. I got through like half of the movie working on the video. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna watch some of the movie before the interview, and I just passed the fuck out. Like I was like. <laughs> 
I was gone. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I w- woke up like, okay, let's go get some fresh air. Then you guys messaged me. I'm like, okay, now I got to go back home, set up because I'm getting some fresh air. Came back here and I'm just like, I'm working on like four hours of sleep plus like a, probably like a 45 minute nap. And I'm just like, yeah. So those power naps really do you and they really will. Oh, I've, I, I, I'm a big fan of not only the power nap, but of the nap and rally. It's like the boot and rally, the puke and rally, but it involves no puke. Just a nap. How many pre-show naps have we done? We did a show last year with the word alive and we got there and we had like three hours. So we literally decided to sleep in the dressing room and our (laughs) bass player at the time literally passed out face down on the floor in the fucking break room. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. So from that point on, we started bringing our Xbox with us so we could play in the dressing room which is actually trying to be a lot of fun a lot of bands get in they play with you like fifa tournaments and shit but then also like you have to remember it's like you know you go on in 45 minutes eh, one more game one more game. and it's like you have 20 minutes like oh all right we gotta move now like now we gotta start yeah so yeah but when you think about it too the fact that you bring your xbox in there that's something that i mean i'm not sure money i'm how many bands would do something like that or think of something like that but it's somewhere where you get all these other bands that are going to be on the bill with you and maybe they show up early too. And maybe they're just trying to find something to do and just try and kill that time between when they have to go on and start getting ready. All of a sudden they see you guys playing FIFA or playing call of duty or something like that. And all of a sudden they're like, Holy shit, we want to get on and like enjoy some of this too. And next thing you know, you've got like Telly Smith yelling at you because you scored on them and it was a bullshit goal in his mind. Uh, yeah. I, um, yeah, I can agree with you hundred percent about that. Yeah. We've had that where we will like, we'll be selling merch, but we'll have like our little, like we'll have like our monitor on the merch table and like, we'll be watching the band, but like we can't sell merch to other bands because no one's going to hear us. And it's also disrespectful at the same time. So we're playing fucking Xbox, watching the band at the merch table. And then the minute they're, they're done, boom, squad, we just go sell merch. We're like, we're kind of the band. It's like, we played with Escape the Fate. We sold so much merch. We sold 37 t-shirts. We actually outsold Escape the Fate and all the other bands combined that night. Damn. We went out in the crowd and went up to every single person trying to sell a shirt. Like, hey, five bucks. Oh, I don't cash. Boom. We got Venmo. We got Cash App. We got credit card. We got debit cards. We got we take student loans. They're like, really? I'm like, no, it's a fucking joke. <laughs> <laughs> PayPal. Anything. anything. Real hard cash, too. So, no, it's a... Uh, you got to kind of make it, you got to put them in a corner where it's like, oh, well, what are we going to do? And I'm like, I got a megaphone. You're going to fucking buy something right now. It's $1. <laughs> I don't have any money. How'd you get in the show? Oh, and I'm like, excuse. <laughs> yeah, because it's always, if you're going to go out and do that, it's going to be like, oh, I don't have any cash on me. Well, you give them the option. You have so many other options. Oh, what well, the money around? How'd you get here? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it kind of like you're kind of, it's kind of like guerrilla marketing in a way too. You're just going out there, just doing this like as crazy as possible. But then again, in the end, I mean, you outsold Escape the Fate and everybody else there that night. So in combined too. So yeah, it freaking works. Sometimes you got to go a step further to make more money or be more successful. And some bands, you know, they rather sit at the table and I'm like, okay, cool. And we're out in the crowd selling shit to people. And you know, at the end of the day, we all walk up money and food. And the satisfaction of moving our merchandise into other people's bodies. And if you guys want to sit at the merch table and cry about it, that's cool. That's not our problem, though. It's not. No, and I've heard a couple other bands too. They've talked about where it's when they set up like the when they have a whole entire merch set up as well. It all depends upon how your interaction with the fans at the show is as well, because those are the people that are going to be buying yourself. Those are the people that are here to see you perform. Those are the people that are going to be, you know, the ones that are going to help make you money because they're going to be the ones buying your shit. They're going to be the ones giving you the money. So whatever you can do to differentiate yourself from the rest in the minds of fans in a positive light, that's going to be, that's going to end up making you guys seem a lot more like the, kind of people that they're going to want to buy merch from or actually make you the kind of people they want to buy merch from through the fact that you're going out there, you're actually interacting with them on a, on a personal level. Cause you're going up, you're talking to them where I've seen a lot of bands. Yeah. They get to the merch table, they sit down, they let the people come to them. That's fine and all, but if there's gonna be a band that's going to go out there and move around and actually talk to you and just come up to you instead of you having to come up to them, that's going to stick out in the mind of a fan. I've learned that from Warped Tour, like when a lot of bands will be out in the parking lot moving their demos, moving their their albums. I'm like, 
it, there is a deal we made and like you know like yeah you can usually borrow them down it's like oh five bucks oh well, come on do two for five it's like okay fine like you know what like we're you know what we're we're gonna be losing money regardless so this is the way we look at it would you rather make some money or no money what's the difference it's either we're gonna make money or we're not making money and you know what us holding on to our merchandise is not making money and you know what if i sold you a shirt and your friend liked it then maybe your friend will buy a shirt and then tell his friend and her friend and this is a, it's it's a fucking snowball effect. that's what it really comes down to yeah and and even with like myself as well it's like sometimes bands will be like hey do you like hey here's a shirt kind of thing if you want it here's this if you want it it, it just enjoy kind of thing and like i've worn some of their shirts in the podcast as well and i've got stuff hanging up around here as well just from those bands as well because well, not only that, but I like their stuff. And it's also it's like if I think it's a cool piece that you're going to kind of like hand off to me or if it's something like if I find a shirt at one of your shows and I buy it. Yeah, I'm going to wear it on the podcast because I think it's cool. And then all of a sudden it's just because I've worn a couple of shirts on here where I've had bands. That's how I connect with them, because maybe I saw one of them on Instagram wearing the same shirt that I was like. And then I asked if they want to be on the podcast and bing, bang, boom. That was like one of my first interviews. That's how I got it was because the guitarist for this band called the Monks of Giants was wearing the same shirt I was. That was it. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I totally agree with that. Look, I have this body stand shirt that says, fuck you from Florida on it. And everyone's like, what does that mean? I'm like, it's Floridians. They don't give a shit about anything, let alone COVID anything. Oh, yeah. And there's even like, well, before COVID hit. And then once, uh, like when I was except at my full-time job and I was in the office still, right after I saw the Ice Nine Kill show, I wore like one of their shirts to work. Okay, this might not have been my best idea because I'm like, okay, you know, it's got ghost face on there with a bloody knife and a bloody phone. So I wonder what the hell's going to happen. I get to the elevator. All of a sudden, the doors are closed. I'm about to go up there and the elevator opens back up again on the first. So I'm like, okay, someone's coming and this is going to be fun. CFO of the company walks into the elevator. Here I am wearing an Ice Nine Kills t-shirt thinking this is going to go well. And all of a sudden, he's like, oh, shit. That's a cool shirt, man. I'm like, wait, 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 really? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I'm not sure how many other people are going to like it, but hey, I'm a fan of it. Like, OK, I got to win here kind of thing. And all of a sudden I started getting some of the, like the Disney ones, like with uh, evil Mickey Mouse, evil Donald oh, yes. Duck. And I started wearing them around the office, too. And instead of people asking me about like what the hell I was wearing or being like offended by it, the most questions I got were, where the hell did you get that shirt? I want one. Yeah, right. So if so, it's like if if you think a band like if you if I'm if you're out there selling your merch and you have a cool shirt out there that people real that someone really likes, they could put it on, wear it, and just go somewhere. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, their friends are gonna look and say, "Hey, where the hell did you get that shirt? That thing is freaking awesome." And next thing you know, they're gonna go and try and find the shirt. Then they're gonna realize it's a Generation Underground T-shirt, and they're gonna think, "Oh, this is a band T-shirt." Well, if I like the T-shirt, let's give the band a try. And they may have not even heard of you in the first place. Or in their grand scheme of things, maybe not giving you a try with your music for another like four or five years. But boom, that's just a start right there. And then all of a sudden they get into it. They listen to your music. They like it. And it's just like a, it's honestly like a virus. It just starts popping up everywhere and just starts spreading. We had a tour literally last year called Spread the Virus. (laughs) Wait, was that last year? We we predicted the future. We really did. All righty. Well, on this episode, Generation Underground predicts the future. More at 11. All right. <laughs> Could really make this like one of those like uh, local news shows. Like, is Generation Underground the next future tellers? A re- <laughs> experts say, well, what experts? Me, the expert says that they did. Yeah. Just have something like that. I mean, it could it could work. I guess I don't know. Only one way to find out. Well, well I mean, well, how did that tour end though? <laughs> was it was did it end good or did it end bad? I mean, it went really well. Like we, I, we, what the fuck was the last, the last date was, uh, oh, it was champs. Oh, really? Yeah. With Vitruvia and then Christian got on there and they sang, we did, we did dance dance from fall out boy, which is the <laughs> most left field song we've ever played live, <laughs> but it did go really well. We did an emo night prior to that we were going to do all these, we were going to do like a sum 41 song, fall out boy, AFI, all this emo shit. And then our guitar player didn't show up. So that just fucking derailed the whole idea. Dude. You would think <sighs> you'd want to play emo night with Craig Owens, but 
But no. No. But no. No. I don't remember where you were that night. I don't remember why you weren't around. I have no idea. <laughs> what was the date? What the hell are you doing? <laughs> February 15th last year. Well, I don't know. February 15th. That was that was a Saturday, right? Yeah, or no, that was last year. So I've been a thir- ah, fuck. I don't even remember. Yeah, they run something. together. But yeah, why like why don't you want to show up for an emo night though? Especially because that because especially those kind of nights. I mean, because emo night became a more nationally known thing. I know. Yeah. No, I went last year and I met this girl there who fucking like fell in love with me in like 20 minutes. She's like, who are you? I was like, she's like, you look like Jeezy. I'm like, have you ever fucking go again with the Jeezy comparisons? <laughs> so. Was she just like yeah. following you around like the whole entire night? Just like. And she just asked like me to Jeezy. dance and then we started baking out and then just, and then just got, just got really frisky after that. That's the best way to play. It just got really frisky <laughs> for like three hours. <laughs> so I, I no no reg, no regrets at all. Definitely not. No regrets. No regrets. <laughs> not even a single letter. No, just just <laughs> fuck it. It was it was it was definitely my favorite emo night out of all the emo yeah. nights we, I've ever been to. So now we played one of the emo nights, and you know, I think our big thing is the bigger the show, the more we get amped and more pumped. But some people they just get scared shitless. They're like, uh, 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 uh. I'm like, you know, it's not a big fucking deal. Like, you're like, well, you know, I have social anxiety. Okay, a, a lot of people have social anxiety. Well, I don't know what to do. I'm like, what are you so fucking afraid of? Yeah, in the, in the end, like everyone has anxiety over something. Because it was, there's a South Park episode that perfectly describes it. It was uh, because it was Cartman was at the uh, they're at the water park or something, and oh, Cartman was like at like like so like. So anxiety thing, and then Kyle just flipped out. He's like, "Guess what? I have anxiety too, but everyone does. We we're just dealing with it because that's how you get through life." And then all of a sudden, Carmen is like, "Oh my god, I got an idea!" And he runs off. All of a sudden, Kyle's like, "Oh god, I did something bad." <laughs> and I forgot how it ended, but it's just like, yeah, there's times in life where it's like, if I go places, there's times where it's like, I'm socially, an- I'm anxious as well too, just because I might be in a situation that I'm not normally in. I, you know what people like a lot of people what holds them back in their careers is taking chances like you don't fucking know until you try but you really don't know and some people are afraid to take the, to take the leap and all right if you fail at least you at least you fucking try at least like like you know not everything's gonna work out but you could probably find some something's gonna work out for you if you try hard enough and then the bet the best thing is when everyone gives up on you they're like oh well the music industry is too hard uh, no it's not if you work it to your angle it's not that fucking hard it's really not yeah and, and one thing to add on that too is is what you're talking about it's people sometimes it's like that anxious and that fear just kind of makes you not try and then it's if you do try and you fail the thing is is you know about it and then later on in life when you're thinking about it when you're like 80 90 years old in old folks home when you're thinking about things instead of actually like if you went out and did it when you were younger and tried and maybe failed when you're thinking about when you're older, you're thinking, hey, at least I don't regret it because I know what the outcome was. If you never did it, though, you're going to constantly be living with that what if feeling. You're going to constantly be living with a certain kind of regret. And that is going to be a killer thing that's just going to end up. I mean, if you talk to people, if you talk to people that are older right now and sometimes you talk to them and if they seem like, you know, they're not necessarily the happiest. If you talk to them, you can take a look in their eyes and they start talking about things that they wish they would have done. Like, I wish I would have tried starting this business. I wish I would have tried like I was in a band and I wish you would have tried harder because it really worked out the way we wanted. It could have worked out the way we wanted to, but we just didn't try for it. And then you just feel that like instant regret they have when they're talking about it. If you go and just try different things, life's going to be happy. Life's like life might not work out the best on all these situations, but something's going to work eventually because you're putting yourself out there. The best way I like to describe it is, is life is not about living inside your comfort zone and hoping good things happen. Life's about living outside your comfort zone and making great things happen. Yeah. I mean, I, I really have to say that's something we've thought about with this band. It's like, all right, we've been very sloppy live. We've been assholes to each other. We've done the wrong things. We've handled things really poorly. And I'm like, you know, let's, let's try the other way around. And like, you know, yeah, it's an adjustment to being like a, a nice cohesive band that gets along as a fight anymore. We, we, we have nothing to fight about anymore, which is great. And it's like, you know what? Like, unless we took the chance, we never would have known how this is like, and we're, and we're like, this is awesome. Like we all get along and just seems like he's going to say something. 
No. Oh, okay. <laughs> you were like leaning in. I was like, oh, he's going to say something. And you're like, hmm. <laughs> yeah. And one thing, other too, is just like we're talking about just trying different things and just going through life with that way, especially with an album like you guys have with Cold Blooded Volume One. It's you take a listen to it versus what I mean, almost anybody else is doing out around there. And there is a difference in your sound than a lot of the people have. And I think from my, from what I was listening to specifically, it's a lot of your, like it's a lot of your vocal style and the vocal patterns that you use that really stand out as a difference between a, like almost any other band. Because when I was listening, it kind of felt like it had like that, like I was talking about that, like spoken word kind of style to it. Yeah. I've gotten that before. Like, like, it, like that's what I kind of picked out of it. It's like, that's a very unique part. And then for your old man, she was like, oh, it sucks. That might have been why, because they just didn't understand exactly what that style was and how it mixed in with everything. And they just didn't want to deal with it. And that's their fucking loss because it's something unique. And especially on some of these songs, it really does stand out with how it compares to what the instrumentation is doing, how everything's constructed and how it just flows all together. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think the reason why we do stand out is because we're not afraid to take the risk of like, oh, you know, well, you guys can't do a drum battle. You guys can't do this acoustic part. You guys, it's like, no, you can't. It's a mental fucking thing. It's like, you guys think we can't, but we're going to do it. And I know you love people say that we can't do things. We end up doing them anyway. It's, yeah. the, it's, it's more of like a yeah. motivating thing. It's like, okay, <laughs> well, so I mean, we, we, can't, we can't do it. All right. So we're going to do it. <laughs> We'll take a look at, I mean, I'll, I'll bring him up again. We brought him up once before on the podcast. Today. We'll bring him up again. Ronnie Radke. Just take a look at all the weird stuff that he's done with mixing different genres, mixing different vocal styles, and just mixing everything in there. And people are saying, oh, you can't do that. You can't do this. You can't do that. Then all of a sudden, it's just like you look back and you're thinking, this guy was so much further ahead of his time than he, than, than he was. And yeah, then you no, take a look I, at something I, like Popular Monster, and all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, my God, this is this is great. Why don't we notice this before? It's like, yeah, because you guys just thought it was crap. And all of a sudden, it's just every all of a sudden, this is just comes out and it's, oh, my God, this is great. Well, he's been doing that for a while. It's just this is the point in time where it just even for people that like his music a lot. This is the point in time where just everything kind of came together at the perfect moment. And then this song came out. It's just like. You're going from these rap parts to these more like hard rock, melodic hard rock kind of things, a little bit of post hardcore in there. Then he gets these like fantastic metalcore style breakdowns. It's like, how the fuck does this all work together? But it's constructed that way. It's all in this, like with that one, it's all in the songwriting and all in the process of how everything flows together. And when it comes to your guys, especially on Cold Blooded, again, it's that it's a vocal pattern and how these different things you're trying on, on all these different songs. It depends on how they all for, uh, work together. Sometimes do I think you hit it? Absolutely. Is there sometimes I think there could be something different? And in my opinion, yeah. But the thing of the fact of the matter is, is you're trying something. You're trying your sound. That's the thing. And of what's going to end up happening is, is there's always going to be people at first when there's going to be something different out. They're always going to push back. I like, oh, we don't like that because it doesn't fit our style. But then all of a sudden, like 10 years down the line, it's like, oh, my God, that's the it's the greatest thing right now. You're like, well, we've been doing this forever. And this is why we're this is like why we're big now, because this is our sound. We created it. We stuck to it. You guys told us not to stick to it. And look at what happened now. And then you just take the mic and just drop it and then walk out. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, the, everyone's got to start somewhere. And the reason why things change is because someone won't take the chance of doing it. But look at all the rappers that have bands behind them now, like Ghost Mane and... Oh my god! Fucking trying other rappers that have um, MGK and you know Jeezy as a drummer and Kodak Black as a guitar player. Like they're you know like they're they're trying to like really integrate. You know, Post Malone plays guitar on stage now, and Travis Scott you know has Manson on um, Astro World Festival. Like you know, like it, it's a real. And the Juice World did that pop punk song with your favorite Travis Barker. <laughs> And then take a look at what Corey Taylor did on his uh with with his solo project with CMFT oh, yeah. must be stopped. I mean, you had Tech Nine on there. I can I uh, was his name Kid Bookie. I yeah, think Kid it was. Bookie. Yeah, he had him on there as well. It's just and it's a whole like rap rock kind of style thing. And it's put this way: is it my favorite song for, that he's ever made? No, it's not. But is it something that I have on my workout playlist because it's perfect to hit the gym with? Oh yeah, it's a, it's a great song to to work out to. Yeah, I mean, it's Corey motherfucking Taylor. You can't expect anything less from him. No, it's all you got that anthemic like push quality too. Like if you're if you're lifting, you're just like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I'll, I'm just taking a look at like because I went through the whole entire thing with uh, Cold Blood Volume One, and I love kind of this one part I put on there because I remember there was something where um I think it would have been like if what with your old manager team trying to push you more into like emo rap. 
just because it was what was popular at the this was popular at the time and it's like oh this might actually fit you guys but it's not what you want to do so remember good old uh finn mckenzie from the punk rock nba he always talks about bands that are butt rock it's just yeah. like the same kind of thing over and over again the butt, the butt rock the dad rock the the butt core which is like the the, the metal core bands that have the butt the butt rock riffs and shit yeah i think, he, I think he called out wage war for that one as well yeah and i and i was looking i'm like there is nowhere like any kind of like thought that you can have of like but whatever. Yeah, it is definitely not anywhere near your sounds. Like you cannot put that anywhere in there because it's it's so dynamic with just how you guys work with the instrumentation, how you work that vocal style in there, and how it just you work with different patterns and different flows throughout the whole entire thing. Yeah, no, totally. And then one thing is I kind of have is like my wrap up because, again, this is volume one I had going forward. I can see that Generation Underground knows how to create songs with dynamic instrumentals and can use influence from different genres and styles. Mike's unique vocal pattern is at times tough to match up with a style like theirs, but they've shown that they can do it and do it well. Now it's time to get back to the lab, play around with it more and use what works in this album to perfect their unique sound so that the masses cannot ignore it anymore. Did you write that up or was that there was someone else write that up? I wrote that up when I was going through the whole entire thing because I always okay. go through each song like in depth and then I'll always do an overall afterwards. This is how I do all my album reviews too. So it's like my note sheet for this podcast because there's five songs there. This note sheet is six pages long. I just literally, I, I mean, yeah, it sounds like that, that I read so, off of something. Yeah, I read off of my note sheet that I wrote um, at the beginning of the week when I did this. Nice. Okay. Yeah. And we appreciate that you care a lot. We've had too many people like our management team at the time who don't care. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a thing too. It's just, there's going to be a difference in terms of quality if you care or not. And, oh, 100%. With, and again, with your music, there is that, there is a quality there, which, because again, like I said, there's a dynamic instrumental. There's the, there's a vocal pattern that at times, again, I know it can be tough to match it up and I keep saying it, but the reason I keep saying it is because you guys do match it up when you play with different styles as well. It does work. So while your management team, old management team said that, um, you, you might want to ask them to go take like a drug test or something because they might have been on something that just made them, you know, not it, the smartest it, people it, in the world. They, they were very big into cocaine, we found out. Very big. They, they kept raving about They're like, do, they're like, do you guys know what these tables are in Vegas? I'm like, well, they're, they're like, cocaine, <laughs> cocaine, God damn it. <laughs> Ugh, fucking load of bullshit. I'll, I'll say if they were just railing cocaine, so probably they didn't want you to do like hair metal. They they threw so many bands and so many musicians <laughs> under the bridge. It was ridiculous. They were saying shit about Mitch Lucker and just hey, it was it was. Re- I'll, I'll tell you off camera about what they said about Mitch Lucker. It was really bad. Oh dear God. Yeah, it was really bad. I don't think you you would. <laughs> I have, I have yeah. Heard. Wait, well, we'll do that one off camera just yeah. so that it's because again we we are we haven't been talking them in the brightest light, but we don't want to just add too much fuel to that fire no yeah i mean you know people could you know there, there's a reason why we don't mention their names because i don't want to give them any fucking recognition because they don't deserve any recognition they really <laughs> don't they really don't so we can talk just as much shit about them without mentioning their names right and then we can't get sued either it's true yeah. <laughs> <Woo-hoo>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll leave it just woo-hoo. but then again it's just that's one thing i always like about this podcast is it's just an open kind it's open kind of thing and i love hearing the truth about everything and everyone being honest because if you're not honest, it's just like, well, what's the point, honestly? Yeah. What's the vibe? Oh, yeah. God. That was, that was their big thing. It was like, bro, what's the vibe? I'm like, I don't know. They're like, come on, dude. What's the vibe? I'm like, okay. And to piss them off, we wrote a song about them, and it's called What's the Vibe? And we made sure it was the heaviest thing we could write just to piss them off even more. Is that one going to be on volume two? No, it's not, sadly. Well, I'll send you a copy of What's the Vibe. Okay, I'm going to want to hear that, especially after <laughs> us talking about this for the, well, I mean, we pretty much started with that whole entire uh, debacle from the beginning, and I mean, we're into this a little over two hours, and we're still <laughs> bringing it up. And- I could go on for hours of just <laughs> how much they pissed us off. It just never fucking ended with the nonsense and the lying and just, you know. We learned a lot. We learned to not procrastinate fucking things. They get worse. That's what we really learned out of this whole experience. But the other thing when you think about it too is, is you kind of have to be, I mean, putting it in a different light and kind of looking at it from the other side as well. Be thankful for that experience as well because you had it at a time where, I mean, because 
you guys are how old again? Because I mean, I think I know you guys. You said your age, like say, because Matt was like what six, just turned sixteen. Yeah, twenty one and twenty one, and then Josh was what nineteen, eighteen. Yeah, so what I'm what I mean by that is like you guys are young enough to the point where something like this, where a bad experience like that, isn't going to completely derail you. Imagine if this would have been lasting on for about ten years, and all of a sudden something like this happened. I mean, that, that completely derails bands. But you guys were able to do it, have an experience like this at a time where all of a sudden you're able to just kind of use it as motivation, use it as a learning tool going forward. So now with the uh, with the uh, publicist and with the management team you have now. You, you know how you found them because you went through this stuff. You're able to learn. You're able to go through these different ideas. And now you know what it's like to be behind a good management team. I think really with them, like r- really dragging us as a band to the point of breaking up, dragging us all person point where we could stand each other to me trying to really trying to end my life of just like just trying to get it to just go away really made us understand of like, okay, you know what? Like, there's a certain fucking source that's triggering all this bullshit and it's from them. It's always from them. And it's just always, it's just this, it's gotta be this way. It's gotta be this way. It's gotta be this way. It's just like, you know, it's our fucking band, you know, it's like, it's our set. Well, you know, we recommend you guys do this thing. Well, we don't want to do that. Well, I don't want to tell you, you guys suck. Well, you guys suck. We'll keep playing this game. We want to keep playing this fucking game. Like it, it just, Oh my God. I, you know, I'm very, grateful in a sense because if shit in this band didn't fall to the ground i wouldn't have gotten the help that i need for my own fucking life behind behind the band just trying to rehab and rebuild my entire life and just understand of like you know what like everything happens for a reason and it's good that we got away from this because now we're getting the return of our investment of how shitty things went last year. We really are getting like the full stick of like, here's what a nice manager looks like. And here's a nice publicist who does their fucking job and doesn't leave the company in the middle of the campaign and tries to go poach money, people's money on fucking PayPal. That did happen. Just so you know, fuck you, Joe. Oh my God. That's just, that's unethical right there. I, you know what? Tell that to the guy who had our one week tour book and then ran with our money. And then we confronted him in person and he still made up more bullshit. And then we told me at 72 hours, give us our money or he's getting sued. Never heard from him again, got sued. And I ran into him three times in public after that. That was real interesting. That was real awkward. <laughs> he didn't say anything to me. I'm like, come on, come on, tough guy. Fucking say it. Do something. Lie again. And the funniest thing is the day before we called him out, we <laughs> we baited him on the phone and we had him go on us. He's like, dude, he's like, we're going to do this tour. It's going to go from Florida to Cali with his band from the UK and Frankie from Emir and Franz from Attila. They're going to uh, piggyback up each other and they're going to be arguing over who's going to get, who's going to sign you guys and you guys are going to go to the UK. And we put it on mute and we just started crying in the car. We were laughing so hard. I'm like, wow, I really wish this was fucking true, but it's fucking not. So. <laughs> oh, dear God. Yeah. It's like a nightmare. Like our song Nightmare Never Ending. It was a nightmare that just would not. It, you just kept waking up in the nightmare. It just would not fucking end. And then when they got fired, it just it went away. And it, 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 it's, oh, my God, so fucking great. It, to me, it seems like a bad dream. Like a, it was just a bad dream for eight to nine months of just the bad bullshit and bad karma. And just like, you know, it's just like at this point, we're like, goodbye forever. You literally went through Groundhog Day right there. Yeah. <laughs> but un- unfortunately, there wasn't a little marsupial that was there trying to see a shadow and Bill Murray wasn't around. No. Yeah. Oh, was funny. I mean, oh, man. I'm thinking about Bill Murray. It's got to get go back to good old... Uh, well, one thing about Bill Murray I can remember is at least you didn't kill him because you thought he was a zombie. Very true. You gotta watch or that like, movie. Or like uh, Jonah Hill and the fucking uh, what was the movie called? This is the end. When he oh yeah. Going, the power of Christ compels you. The power of Christ compels you. Oh really, Jay? Does it compel me? <laughs> 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 He's tied to the bed and just, dear God, this is Jonah Hill from Moneyball. <laughs> oh, <Jonah. God. laughs> that part killed me. 
Or was oh it when his, was his season sorry was like down the hole and Kevin Hart was trying to kick him? He's like, no, or no, Craig Rob said, no, you're already in the hole. <laughs> <laughs> and then he drags Kevin Hart down with him. Oh, oh God. Oh, God, that movie was... I remember watching that movie when I was in... Because it came out, like, between my senior year of college and my fresh... Or senior year of high school and my freshman year of college. And we got drunk one night in my dorm room and watched it. That that might have been the best way to watch it. Just because everyone was ridiculous. My buddy passed out on his fridge. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, we're going to get... He, like, he was taking shots ever clear. was, like, passed out all the time. I was, like, going to get some more for some people. I'm like, Sam, do you want one? Huh? That's a no. Come on, get me one. I ain't no bitch. Okay, so I go over, pour, pour in a shot glass. I look over, and there he is, just like passed out, like over his mini fridge, just like, uh. <laughs> That's like our um, former guitar player who decided to do six shots of vodka in a half hour and then got up. Well, they went to sleep, like, all right, no biggie. Gets up and he yapped all over the carpet. And then yes. to make it worse, he ate it. Off the carpet. Oh, what? Yeah. Uh, it was one of the most, it was the craziest night of my entire life. Why, why would you eat it back? Oh, dear God. <laughs> You've gone through some really crazy guitar players, man. Oh, I know. There's one next to me still. <laughs> yeah, but this one's sticking around, though, and not eating his own puke. Uh, yeah, or doing no, fucking, do or doing <laughs> coke and fentanyl and PCP and whatever else he's fucking done. It's, it's, oh dear God! Yeah, he, he's got a problem. We love you, Justin. <laughs> we love the big ball of crack. Oh, yeah. God. <laughs> I don't want to be a mean crack. Dude. I just want to be a nice one. Like, hey, how's it going? Want some crack? <laughs> I don't know what movie that's from, but it, sure, I can't even remember. Yeah, sounds like a Will Ferrell thing. Yeah, all right. But uh, so coming to Cold Blooded Volume Two now, I have to make some kind of weird transition after that. So, what can we expect off of Cold Blooded Volume Two? Uh, a lot of Chelsea Grin influences and a lot of Chelsea Grin members on our shit. Um, a lot of breakdowns, a lot of heaviness, a lot of anger, a lot of pain, and a lot of face melting lyrics, riffs, and vocals. And some pounding drums that are going to fist you up the ass. Oh, hmm. Well, who doesn't like pounding drums that fist them up the ass? Well, weak people, that's who. Exactly. So, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to it when it comes out as well. But I know you spoke, told me what the day is earlier. But would you mind telling the people what day we can expect Cold Blood Volume 2 to be released? November 13th. Friday, November 13th, 2020. So we're getting a nut. We're getting the second half of Cold Blooded on the scariest day of the year, Friday the Thirteenth, and it's also in the wackiest year possible. Yeah, that sounds like it fits. Yeah, much like because the first part was released on four twenty. It just you guys are picking like the best days to release that stuff. Four twenty twenty. Oh, that's the first album. <laughs> Didn't that come out four twenty two? What the first one ever? Yeah. No, it was, it was Friday the 13th, the first one. It was October 13th. Oh. Yeah. If, October, I feel like we did October 13th, August 31st, 420, and November 13th. Hmm. When you say November 13th, you got to always put, but it was on a Friday. And just. Sure. It was on a Friday. Just make sure when you wake up that day and it's like out, like album release day, the first thing you have to do is you have to wake up. And play Thank God It's Friday by Ice Nine Kills. And you're just going to get jazzed up and be like, ready to go for the day. Just like, <gasps> thank God it's Friday. And just like, yeah. Well, that's going to be me that day. So I hope yeah, you guys are I, the same. I mean, tomorrow, Josh, Josh does not know what I'm going to say next. You know, Slaves of the System came out four years ago today. Really? The first version. Damn. I feel old. That's I really feel crazy. old. That was, I was 17 when that came out. That first ever incarnation of Slaves of the System. Mm. We worked so hard on that fucking song, and we rewrote it so many more times. Yeah, we, re- we rewrote that song three fucking times. Yeah. So they're making me feel because, like, four years ago, well, from tomorrow, that tomorrow we're shooting from when we shot this four years ago. Like, I was moving in, I was moving back to Minnesota for my last semester of college. Now you guys are making me feel old with that shit. I was fourteen. <laughs> they're making me feel even older. <laughs> you were twelve. I was. 12. He was twelve. 
Now you're making me feel like an old man, like even older, like like an old man. You know, get me a freaking cane and a walker. I'm gonna go on Social Security. Where's my Medicare? Right. Oh my God. <laughs> Where'd you go to school at? University of Minnesota. Okay. So I was, I was a golfer. A golfer. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, my buddy's a diehard Minnesota Viking fan. He lives in New York, but he loves the Vikings. I don't even know why. I have to, I'm going to ask him that actually why. Well, yeah. if your buddy's a Viking fan, I got to say this. Good call. <laughs> yeah. Should, then I should have so, wow. the Vikings hat. This would have been perfect. Uh, Vikings fan. It's it, for the podcast. <laughs> it would have been the perfect time. He just all of a sudden had the Vikings. I wish I had it because I had it on for the last episode I recorded because it was like the – it had a hat from last year and it had the NFL 100 on there. And the last one I recorded before okay. this one was my 100th episode. So I'm like – I didn't even realize it until I was doing the outro for it. I was like – like you, like if you watch the video for that one, you'll just see me kind of go like, huh? And just like look at the camera and I see him just like – I just start laughing because I'm like, you got to be kidding me. How did I pick this one? Like pick this hat for this day. Yeah. I, I got another. I got an interview coming up with a or recording after this one in a couple of days with a band from Minnesota. So I'm like, okay, I got a Hicks shirt, I got a Gopher shirt on, Vikings hat on, and watch the guy I'm gonna interview is gonna be like a Packer fan or something. Be like, God damn it! Right. <laughs> I'll be like, oh well, it feels like I'm at home anyway. Most of the time, I'm when I'm here. Well, because I'm maybe I mean, I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I grew up here, so I've always been like the social pariah when it comes to sports, but. <laughs> It's always kind of funny. I've learned how to use it to my advantage to where people try and get at me like at a bar, just like make fun of me. But I just kind of roll with the punches to the point where if I'm winning, if my team's winning and wins, hey, I have a good time because we won. If my team loses, though, I usually get a shit ton of free drinks. Yeah, because everyone apparently feels bad for me, but I I roll with it. I've had a time where all of a sudden people were booing me every time I got to go to the bathroom. By the time I got back, some some somebody bought me like a like a Jaeger bomb or something. I'm like, well, this yeah. is nice. Yes. I had to make sure. I'm like, wait, did you guys put something in this? Because this is at a bar in Madison for the uh, Wisconsin Minnesota uh, uh, the act game last year. And I was like, did someone put something in this? And all of a sudden, my brother's behind the bar and he's just like, no, I made it. I'm like, okay, then something's definitely in this. <laughs> I just slammed it. <laughs> Yeah, we talked about Jaeger bombs in our song called GTS on volume two. So, oh, dear God. Is there, is there some kind of story behind these Jaeger bombs now? Because um, I'm curious. Let me, let me reread the lyrics and let's, let's, let's investigate this a little bit more. It's a half, it's a half hour song. It's a half Machine Gun Kelly song. And no, I'm not Machine Gun Kelly. Megan Fox would be here right now. And that would be getting us a lot more views. Uh, according to what I wrote, where the fuck is the goddamn Jaeger bomb? Uh, cops raise it up. Oh, break up, break up. I want a girl in my lap with a Jaeger bomb. Nice. <laughs> um, break up, break up. I want a girl in my lap with a Jaeger bomb. That sounds like some like Hollywood Undead stuff right there from like a their lot second of Hollywood album. Undead, a till a kind of inspiration for the lyrics. For this. I want to chase this with you, but I want a girl in my lap with a Jaeger bomb coming in hot. You heard me, yeah. <laughs> oh god i gotta listen to that song again i used to be i used to listen to hollywood Dead so much and i don't listen to them that much anymore some of their new stuff's really good it's like really heavy it's weird it's different <laughs> off of volume one from the uh what was it was that no, wasn't what's the other guy what was the album i gotta i gotta pull it up here uh new empire because i was listening to i listened to some of it and there were some songs like the singles they put out for it i was really disappointed i'm like god they're like they took what they had in like five and just because at five wasn't I didn't think it was that good, but then like oh it just keeps getting not that good. All of a sudden I downloaded the day that it uh st- was like it came out and I'm like okay got the day it came out let's I was working I was at the gym like okay let's put it on it was like time bomb was the first one. I'm like okay this is the single I thought was okay then all of a sudden you get to heart of a champion while I'm working I'm like are you freaking kidding me this is what I came for then you're going to song an enemy and upside down that has Kellen Quinn and I'm like dude. They're doing it again. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I was Fuck. so happy. You gotta try listening to Empire with like the bass boost on. That thing hits so fucking hard. Let's see, I'd have to go to. I'd have to like. Uh, I think it's oh, on. Vo- yeah, it's on Volume One. Yeah, Empire's on Volume One. It was the. I think it was the last single that they had on it because it came. Yeah, it was a single a month before. Because I remember listening to it because I had to drop my car off at a. Uh, auto body shop and I completely missed something by not having my head turned right because I saw you guys laughing hysterically oh, what was in my face I'm an ass fuck. 
Oh, just lowered it? the share. Oh, yeah. I was gonna say, or is it called twenty six? It could have been either or. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, when I was listening, like cause I was, because I was listening to Empire while I was walking in the cold from this auto body shop back to my parents' house because I was gonna work from my parents' house that day because I had to get like a couple of O2 sensors replaced on my car and it was like freezing out, like maybe like five degrees out, and I'm just walking about two miles home and I'm just listening to, <laughs> to Empire. I'm like, oh man, I hope this gets, I hope the, because I wasn't a big fan. I'm like, I hope the album gets a, like better for, well, what I like it. Then all of a sudden, I like, when it came out again, Hurt Hearted Champion while working, I'm like, okay, we're in. Like, this is yeah. it. And then Enemy, I'm like, oh man, we're even in even more. Yeah, yeah no, totally. I'm excited to see what happens when Volume 2 comes out, because, hey, maybe they copied you with the whole Volume 1, Volume 2 thing. Oh, with <laughs> us or them? Yeah. No, they copied you. Oh, even yeah. though Volume that's 1 came it. out before Volume 1 of yours <laughs> came out. <laughs> early scene definitely copied me definitely <laughs> did for sure oh charlie him and johnny three tears <laughs> god i gotta i haven't i was, I was mad I was, like because with the whole entire covid thing i was supposed to see them live for the first time in a couple of years this year i was like oh this is gonna be great because they're playing with bad wolves and fire from the gods and from ashes to new I'm like this is gonna be great all of a sudden covid hits i'm like okay everything's getting postponed that was the first one we got this is just outright canceled i'm like god fucking damn it <laughs> yeah i mean Hollywood, that's great live and so is um from ashes to new i miss when they had the old singer and they had the old drummer as you speak very close to those guys and bad wolves i mean they just <laughs> oh my god bad wolves destroys yeah, and i'd never seen i only what van i'd seen out of that bill was up to that point was hollywood undead but i wanted to see from ashes to new especially after they came out with panic i'm like oh man i want oh, yeah. i want like, i want to hear that live want to hear fire from the gods i knew they were going to cr- bring a good show and then bad wolves i'm like well just i'm I, I don't I'm not the biggest in the battles. I'm like, OK, let's just see how this kind of ends up. But yeah. there, God, there's so many other shows I freaking missed out. Uh, like Volbeat got canceled. And that was the one show where I was going to actually because normally I go to shows just by myself. That was the one where like I had friends that wanted to go and actually like enjoy the show completely. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to have people to hold my shit so I can crowd surf for the first time. Nope, not anymore. <laughs> yeah, it'd be like that. It really do. God damn it. 2020. Yeah. <laughs> Got a lot of things going on, but uh, it'll be the year. Yeah. So 2021's gonna be the year. Yes, 2021 is gonna be the year, and well, taking a look at the time, I got an idea. How about for the next time we do an interview like this in 2021, and we actually like, okay, what the fuck is going on? Where? What are you guys doing with concerts and whatnot? Because by that time, I mean, I'm hoping, I'm praying, I'm gonna be like Jonah Hill, like God, it's Kevin from the Corporate Progression Podcast. I'm gonna pull off something like that and be like, can you just bring back concerts, like? every new concert for 2021 because that'd be great because you know we kind of all miss them and by all of us i do mean all of us so yeah we miss playing we really do yeah Yeah, so how about how about the next time we have you guys on it'll be 2021 it'll be after volume two comes out and we'll be able to just kind of talk about what happened with volume two how your management team and your uh, publicist really helped push that out because all of a sudden your Spotify listenership is going to constantly just skyrocket. And then well, all of a sudden what happens with when these concerts start going on? Like, who are you guys playing with? Um, I mean, I don't know. You might be opening for like Chelsea Green, especially with all the stuff you guys are doing with them. I think that'd be a good uh, place to start. I mean, we're playing with Attila next April. It's not announced yet, but I'll announce it. I don't really give a shit anymore. It's us, Volumes, Spite, Dead Ground. And us. Vibes on that too. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> there goes the big ball. Oh my god. I'll say when the big ball comes out, that's when you know that's when the uh when it's time to bring this to a little bit of a uh little bit of a wrap, I guess. Okay, Mostly yeah. because it's because you can't hit throw that big ball over the camera and I can't catch it over here. Imagine we, we, we did like imagine it like uh you throw it and then you just <laughs> <laughs> it'd be like those it'd be like those tiktoks with the vikings and with kirk cousins like oh imagine catching a pass from kirk cousins you guys would throw and i just look and be like <laughs> a virtual pass yeah, yeah just what the hell man you pass the needle available on the oh. 13. oh that's a good plug right there <laughs> mike with the good plug so before we wrap this up call it give it a close i'll let you guys do some final remarks for yourselves whatever you guys want to say whatever you guys want to promote go for it right now because this is the perfect time to do it so you guys take it away um yeah some new music video september 18th show kind of the core uh, Cold-Blooded Volume 1, available now, like always. 
Generation Revamp self-titled album, also available like always. Uh, what a Volume 2 coming November 13th. Our Betrayal, lead single featuring Pablo Viveros of Chelsea Grin. I got it right. It's the ninth yeah. fucking time. Yes. And he did not call me any more times, so we stayed at 25 times as well. Yes. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so, and we have a, uh, hopefully, not going to get some other guy from Chelsea going to be on one of the other songs. And uh, that's a secret. <laughs> it's a secret. It's a secret. It's not confirmed. That's why it's a secret. Yeah. <laughs> and uh yeah we're looking forward to the ass you know our socials are always at generation under or underground and on youtube spotify instagram apple music amazon google play blah 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 blah, blah facebook cool. twitter your mom tiktok what and all that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great way to put it but when it comes to so everyone listening when it comes to where to find them where to listen to this music where to stream it all where to get it you guys i know you guys just want a one-stop shop where it's like oh i don't want to search this stuff up i wish i could just click a link and just go right to everything i need well you motherfuckers take a look at the description of the video or the podcast on spotify or podcast or google play because you're going to find the links to all their socials to their website to where you can buy their merch where you can buy those physical copies of those albums and where you can stream this music as well and then you'll be able to stay in touch with them so follow them subscribe to them uh listen to their music buy some merch otherwise uh mike's gonna come to your house with a bullhorn and ask you why you didn't buy anything all right so i'm expecting to go like door to door throughout america just doing this you're you're basically gonna but you got to do it faster than they did the census so i think you've got a pretty good chance at winning that one yeah yeah we, we have a lot of self promotion where are you going He's getting the megaphone. Oh, he's getting the megaphone? Oh, no way. You can find me on Instagram at Josh Red. You can find this fucker at Matt Schussler Drums, I think. Yeah. This is his Instagram. And Mr. Michael Florentine at Michael Florentine. G-U? G-U or something like that. Oh, God. Oh, God. (laughs) Here's the microphone. It's so loud, dude. Um, I'll have to add the, uh, your guys' socials on there as well, too. I just normally add the bands, but I'll add yours on there as well. Oh, God. Oh, Kevin. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're definitely going to scare America by bad, and then buying merch. I mean, but again, yeah. you got to go door to door. Do it census style. You got to get gotta get the fanny pack, the safari hat on, the bullhorn, but everything says Generation Underground on it. You have a trick when they don't buy merch, you put this in right in their ear. <laughs> Oh no! Oh my God! I'm just taking a look at like on the mixer, and it's just normally where your vocals are, and all of a sudden, when you just did that, it takes up the whole entire line. Yeah. Oh my God! I'm gonna have to put like a warning on this episode. Warning: There's a bullhorn at the end of it. (laughs) Exactly. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Alrighty, so wrapping this up, everybody, please, 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 once again, follow Generation Underground on all their socials that are in the description of the video and of the podcast. Stream their stuff. Um, watch the videos, buy some merch. Otherwise, again, Mike's going to come with that bullhorn and, well, buy it before he has to come to your house. We'll put it that way. And yeah. then when it comes to the Corporation Podcast, please subscribe to us at My Song Day Rock Tells Day on our YouTube channel where you can watch all these videos. Um, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or Spotify. And hopefully by the time this comes out, iHeartRadio as well because I submitted it to that. So hopefully we're on even more places for you guys to listen to us. Um, what else is there? Yeah, please like the podcast. Please rate it, um, hopefully five stars. But if you think it's one star, um, I hope you don't give it one star, I guess. But um, I'll respond to that one and be like, hey, yeah, what do you think about it? Why. We'll and get a conversation about it. Yeah, why yeah. available now? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, but, yeah, and buy all their stuff too. So, you know, support these artists. That's basically what the best way to put it. Just we'll support them. We'll keep upselling if you don't buy it. Exactly. Yeah, they'll keep upselling if you don't buy it. And um like they said earlier they've got the music video for got a uh, shook into the core coming out on september 18th and they've got singles coming out from cold-blooded volume 2 coming up in october with the release of that album coming out on friday november 13th of this year in 2020 so make sure you guys have that marked on your calendars write it in um give yourself a little google calendar reminder or um etch it in your arm i really don't care but just make sure you remember yeah no totally we can't wait to drop this album and on that note mike matt and mr josh thank you guys for being on the podcast once again and i think this is the third you're the third band that i've had that has had done more than one episode with me so you guys are an elite company with that one so first off yay and second off 
Well, we'll do this again in 2021. Once, hopefully, once show yeah. go, and then we can take a look back at Cold Blooded Volume Two. Really dive deep into that again as well, and see how everyone liked it, how everyone responded to it, and we'll also just see from where your growth was the first time we talked till now, and now seeing yeah. from where your growth is now until then. We'll go through all that. We'll have a blast, and we'll keep telling all these crazy stories as well. Because, well, I mean. This didn't seem like as long as it was. I mean, this is over two and a half hours, and it felt like it was yeah. like maybe an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah, not totally. Yeah. So on that note, guys, I'm not going to end it with a goodbye because, well, you guys have been on here twice, so that's definitely not a goodbye. I'm just going to end it with the classic because I'm probably well, because we're going to do this again. And when I get to play live, when you guys get to play live, I'm going to go see it as long as I can, if it makes sense. Because <laughs> just like come around like Wisconsin or if you're in Chicago or something, just let me know. But I'm going to end it with, not a goodbye, but end it with a, see you later. See you later. See you later, brother. Bye. Whoa, 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 folks. That was my second ever interview with the band Generation Underground. And I really hope you guys enjoyed that one because that one was one of my favorites due to the fact that we had so much fun in that one. It was wacky. It was ridiculous, but it was awesome in every step of the way. So please look at the description for this podcast. You can find where you can find them, all their socials, all where you can stream their stuff. Remember that Cold Blood Volume 2 comes out on Friday the 13th, November 13th, 2020. They've got music videos dropping this next month and they've got uh, their first single coming out in October as well. And when it comes to My Sunday Rock 2008, please follow our stuff on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, subscribe to this podcast, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play. Like, subscribe, rate. Please do that because we are working to continue to grow and also become like the biggest podcast in the rock and metal scene. I mean, it's a big, lofty ambition, but it's going to happen, especially after that um, email guy said, please come back with us. You can have a few thousand followers. I'm like, challenge accepted. I want to get that by the end of the freaking month. So, well, yeah, this month, September. So, yeah, we're going to make that happen. And, well, guys, thank you for listening. And get ready for Generation Underground Part 3. It'll come up in 2021. So that's going to be for me, guys. Thank you guys for watching the and listening to the Core Progression Podcast, brought to you by My Sunday Rock 2008, where we're unearthing the underground and rock and metal music, giving you guys the interviews with the emerging bands in the scene so you can get in with them now and break to all your friends that, he, 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 I knew about them before you did. My name is Kevin, and you guys know how I end every single one of these episodes of the Big Healthy and Hearty. See you. Yeah.